If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 371 And Jin, by instinct, did, but Johnny was dumbfounded enough that he missed the command. Taking a crossed air slash at his chest, that sent him back a few meters, his clawed feet digging trenches in the ground. Still, there was no injury. Johnny blinked and looked at Kobe, who was retracting two arm blades from his hands. He can even withstand my air slash. Kobe mumbled, you know, that's just downright cheating. And that's me saying it. While his own fruit gave him regenerative abilities, getting hurt wasn't something people liked. Shishishi, what else do you expect from a mythical zoan? Luffy said, griffins have the durable body of a lion. They might not be dragons, but they are considered to have strong hides, even Kuina had trouble cutting through Lafit when he went half Zoan. And while Johnny might not be there yet in terms of durability, as I'm pretty sure Lafit had trained his fruit to be more durable, but he's still vastly stronger compared to others. True, he also has wings, so flight shouldn't be an issue. Kobe said, but then again with Jeppo, it isn't an issue for anyone. Still, you might want to work on your flight ability. With his unbreakable skin, he will be a menace in the sky. I wouldn't say unbreakable skin, Sparky said, who had just gotten near Johnny. Even though Sparky had gotten taller, he was still half the height of half Zoan Johnny. I beat Lafitte, and I found out a few of his weaknesses. Oh, you mean your sea stone chainsaw? That thing is an abomination. Kobe said, almost shivering at that thing. Sparky darkly chuckled, before quickly changing back to a kid-friendly monkey, not quite. He said stretching all three of his right hands forward like fists, can you stretch out your right hand, it might hurt a bit. Johnny now a bit confident, nodded and stretched out his bird-like palm that had talons for nails towards Sparky's three fists. And just as he did, Sparky attacked, not moving an inch from his spot, Rokuagan. Ack. Johnny hissed he took back his hand, he felt the attack in his bones and muscles. And it hurt like a bitch. Even though there wasn't any notable wound on his hand, he could still feel the pain from inside. So, shockwave-based attack still hits hard, hey? It's a given with how they neglect one's durability and directly attack the insides of the target. Zoro said, a small, I still haven't gotten internal destruction down yet, so this might help. Johnny felt a shiver run down his spine, hey, it might even train your internal durability. Welcome to the punching bag club. Jin said with a flat expression, where we are the punching bags. Hey. You don't have to be so crude about it, Kobe said. Jin gave him a flat look, you use the spikes on my back to sharpen your own claws. Kobe shamelessly smiled, like I said, you don't have to be so crude about it. Luffy just laughed, don't worry Johnny, you will get used to it. And besides, Bartos' shields are far better for learning and honing internal destruction. Ugh, thanks, I guess. He said, before looking down at his hand, the pain was already lessening. The recovery rate is also amazing, man, I lucked out, didn't I? The others just laughed, happy for their crewmate. Wait, we still have Yusaku to get his fruit. Luffy said, looking at him, I'm gonna be honest with you. I already have someone in mind for that fruit, but if you want it. Um, no captain. Yusaku said, clearing his throat, I actually have a fruit in mind that I want. But, uh, it's a bit of a hard to get, but... Now, I'm curious. Luffy said, is it a Zoan? Yusaku blinked, yes, a mythical Zoan. Ha. Huh. Thought so. I always thought you would work great with that kind of fruit. Luffy said, but a mythical Zoan is kind of rare, you know. It's not something we can even find in auctions. But hey, speak your mind. It might take a few years, but we might get that in the future, sometimes being patient in the long run pays off. Luffy was thinking about Teach, not the best example, but the man had a zealous dedication for that one fruit. Even now, Yusaku was a bit hesitant, it's a pretty powerful fruit. Come on, spill it. Zoro grunted, fruits can only get you so far. There are people that are far stronger than you and me, even without devil fruits. Of course, he was thinking about Myhawk and Shanks. Luffy just nodded. He had spoke to Zoro before about giving him the griffin fruit as Kuina rejected it. But Zoro had rejected the fruit for more or less the same reason. And it was true, Haki mattered the most in the long run. His grandpa, Bogard, Roger, Rayleigh, Shanks, and Myhawk were prime examples of top-tier people without any fruit, just raw strength. 
so yet, he could understand it. But at the same time, Luffy also thought differently. If he was given a chance to eat another fruit, he would. Not even questioning the how of things. While some people might see devil fruits as crutches, that was a complete misunderstanding of things. Some people are born strong, like Odin, Kaido, and Big Mom. Not to mention the whole extinct race of Lunarians. But are they considered to have crutches? No, people will pay it off as having natural-born talent. Heck, even fishmen are ten times stronger on land than humans. And they gain double that strength in the sea. It didn't matter if you were born with strength or earned it through hard work. At the end of the day, what mattered was how strong you were. It might be hard to understand for some. But back before coming to this world, he was a power lifter. A very good one at that. But he was no national level winner in any lifts. Even with almost ten years of training, people much younger than him were able to beat him in strength just because of genetics. Same for height and looks. Some people are born tall with good looks, while others are average or even short with sub-PAR looks. Back in that world, those kinds of things couldn't be changed, but here they could so why wouldn't he? Was he ever lacking in hard work? Nah. He made sure to be the hardest working motherfucker in the room. And yet some things are just completely out of your control. So no, he didn't view devil fruits as being shortcuts. That was just the wrong way of seeing things, in his opinion. Still, he respected Zoro and Kuina who stuck to their beliefs. Anyway, what's your choice? Luffy asked. It's the... Yusaku said, and the people in the room had a surprising looks on their faces. Yusaku, like Usopp, had a great admiration for the giants. Mainly because of their strength, so he chose a fruit that would give him just that with a bit of extra. Luffy just grinned before laughing. A very bold dream, and I love it. He said, setting his feet on the nearby chair, I won't promise anything, but, ha, just get strong. I will see if I can do anything or not. Chapter 372 Two days later. Most of the crew were back in the training room but this time Anchor was there with them. He was on the side, training with Kobe to get used to his new powers and use it for combat. Both Kobe and Anchor were men of justice or that's how most of the Straw Hats saw them. All upright and ready to throw themselves to help people. Of course, most of the Straw Hats were about helping people, but even then both Kobe and Anchor took it up a notch. Everyone had their own quirks in the group, so nobody really bothered them with that. Each member of the crew had a goal of their own, and it was the crew's duty to help each other fulfill this goal. In the dungeon room, most of the people were overseeing Johnny's training with his new powers. It's been a few days so Johnny was getting quite good at using his new arsenal of skills. Still there were many areas to improve. Especially since his fruit was a zoan type, those were meant for the physical category, normally. The more someone trained with their Zoan power, the stronger they got. So, Johnny was, of course, getting pushed to his limits so most of the crew was there helping with that. Luffy on the other hand was training Yusaku instead. They were also outside of the dungeon, in the cleared out section of the forest. It was night time so visibility was low. And yet for both of the Straw Hat Pirates, it was enough. Luffy could have trained by himself, but he did give himself time in the morning. So rather than just ending the day, when Isoka requested to train with him, Luffy had agreed. Luffy also kind of felt bad for the guy. Especially since he won't be getting his fruit anytime soon. So the least he could do was to help his eager crewmate. Even though Johnny and Yusaku were similar. Yusaku was much more ambitious and stubborn, while Johnny was much more mild and a bit hard-headed. Both of them shared one thing in common and that was having good ambition. Sure they didn't have some grand ambition like being the strongest or anything like that. But they also wanted to be recognized, to get notoriety, to be strong enough to stand for their beliefs, and to help their captain fulfill his dream. And also, both Johnny and Yusaku were good people. Back in Alabasta and the Marine Base incident, they helped many people directly. Sure helping people might not be their end goal, but both of the former bounty hunters were genuinely good people. And unlike the few newer members of the crew, Luffy could trust both of them. So when he had time, he tried to help them any way possible. That's why Luffy wasn't even reluctant to give them a fruit. Luffy had to be honest, even though Anchor joined the crew, he was a bit of a wild card. Sure the man was all good and ups, but he wasn't fully loyal to Luffy and his cause. Every moment he made at least one of the Straw Hats keep an eye on him. He didn't want any marine spies on his ships. 
luckily that wasn't the case. Building Stormforge for Sabo was a good way to show his true goal. Anchor had said before his main goal was to become the best weaponsmith and also something else. But Luffy couldn't just take his word for it. So making a weapon for Sabo was also a test you could say. If he did have any ulterior motives, such as helping the world government behind his back, then he wouldn't have built such a great weapon for Sabo. From now on, he could trust Anchor a bit. But for Johnny and Yusaku, that wasn't the case. They were loyal and they trusted Luffy. So as their captain, whenever there was a chance he tried to help them back. Loyalty wasn't something that was built in one day. And even then loyalty could change if someone was in a bad circumstance. It might not be the best example, but Squard of the Whitebeard Pirates was a good example. He didn't want any of that happening to any of his crewmates. And that's a big reason to keep them in check. And that was by getting involved somewhat in their personal matters especially since both Johnny and Yusaku would be his main officers. But that was way later when the crew was big enough to accommodate it. For now, they were still a small crew. Most of the time, Luffy tended to train Johnny as they used similar weapons. A Naginata and a spear have a lot of things in common. So he could give a lot of insights on how to use his weapon. But that didn't mean he didn't train Yusaku, no he did. Yusaku used a shield, a round shield. So Luffy tried teaching him how to ricochet his shield back and forth like a certain hero. And sure enough, Yusaku was able to learn it. He did that a while back when they were still in Alabasta, and now he had gotten better at it. Luffy stood there as Yusaku charged at him with a war cry, an axe, and a shield in his hands. Luffy wasn't using any of his gears, so Yusaku was slightly taller and bulkier than him. The former bounty hunter came in with multiple fast swings with his axe, each strike creating wind blades that were strong enough to cut through ordinary buildings. And Luffy was easily dodging them. You have gotten better, Luffy said as he ducked from one of the strikes, Jin has been training you guys well, but it would be tough for you to learn that if you only have this much strength. I haven't gone full out yet, Yusaku said as he pushed all of his strength into his legs, using a sora that cracked the ground beneath him. The former bounty hunter came in like a bull with his shield in the front. Shielding bull. Really? Shielding bull? That's just uncreative. Luffy gave him a deadpan as he stretched out his right hand intending to stop him. But the moment Luffy managed to grab it, his hand slipped and Yusaku almost managed to hit him with his axe. Almost in the last moment, Luffy bent backwards, Neo-style, dodging the axe by a hair's breadth. TCH, almost had you. Your shield really is annoying, Luffy said, it's a slippery one, I will give you that. Of course, this wasn't the same shield that Yusaku was using before. It was given as a gift by Anchor. Anchor as a smith, liked to build weapons. Swords, shields, and all of that. But he rarely used most of the things he built. Mainly giving them away for either a price or for free. His shield was one of the weapons Anchor built using the smooth smooth fruit. Anchor, after gaining his munch munch fruit, gave this shield to Yusaku as using a devil fruit and a devil fruit weapon at the same time would run his stamina dry pretty quick. And of course, the smith was working on a new project, so he wanted to give away his shield to a capable user. Yup, Subashi, she's a great shield, Yusaku said with a grin as he kept his shield at the front. His captain had a habit of taking people off guard so he was cautious even while fighting. Luffy gave him a nod of admiration. The smooth smooth fruit was great in many ways. It wasn't some high class devil fruit, but the ability to make your body slippery from most attacks was something that was pretty useful. But you shouldn't rely on her too much, though. A devil fruit weapon takes up a lot of stamina. Luffy said with a shrug. He was speaking from experience, his nameless Naginata was running him dry whenever he used its energy abilities too much. A small grin formed on Luffy's face, let's get a bit serious shall we? Yeah, I know. That's why I keep her for emergencies. With that Yusaku stepped forward, spun and threw his shield at Luffy. The shield bounced off the ground as it came like a destructo disc towards Luffy's head. Luffy for once didn't back down and brought his fist down with Haki, smashing the shield into the ground. Stopping it. Usually with that kind of power, a normal shield would have shattered but Subashi slipped most of the damage outwards and only got stopped. Yusaku used that chance to use Soru and blur right in front of Luffy with his axe pulled backward. Ground splitter. Clang. The axe was stopped right between Luffy's teeth before the rubber man punched Yusaku in the gut and sending him flying without his axe. Chapter 373 
Luffy threw off the axe to the side as he cocked both of his fists back, get ready. Gomo Gomo no Tekai Gatling. Yusaku still midair crossed his arm, Tekai. Luffy's punches came in like cannon shots, each faster than the previous one, but Yusaku gritted through the attacks with his own iron body. Still, the bounty hunter was sent back hurling to the ground, skipping a few times before he stopped. But before he could catch a breath, Luffy had moved on to his next attack. This is a poking shootout. Luffy grinned taking both of his arms to the side, air finger bullet barrage. From his fingers, multiple small air bullets smashed into Yusaku's location. The bounty hunter in question quickly used Soru and Jeppo to get out from his position but wherever he went, Luffy would point his endless barrage of air bullets at him. Making him very hard to get near. Yusaku dodged for a while, before biting the bullet and going straight for Luffy. Even with Luffy holding back, Yusaku had almost no chance of winning. Yet he refused to give up. Tempest kick. Yusaku yelled. A giant arc of air went came out from his leg as Luffy's bullets were briefly overpowered, giving Yusaku the chance he needed. Of course, the Tempest Kick got decimated by Luffy's powerful air bullets. The former bounty hunter came to the ground and took the shield just in time as Luffy came in with a kick to the side that he wasn't able to dodge. Yusaku's body bent around Luffy's leg as he got planted into the ground, skipping with the grace of a ragdoll, before he was able to stop himself. Shit, what gives Captain? I thought you were holding back. I am. Yusaku was wide-eyed as he quickly spun with his shield to block Luffy's attack. But rather than it being a punch or a kick, he had both of his fists forward. For others, it might have confused them, but for Yusaku it kind of terrified him. Rokuagen. Ga. Yusaku was thrown back several meters, even with his feet digging trenches into the ground. His body was shaking with blood coming out of his mouth, shit. He coughed up blood as he fell to the floor on his knees, keeping his eyes on the captain. Around him the ground was distorted, blown away, with deep trenches going around him, only the ground behind him was somewhat still in shape. Even though Subashi, Yusaku's shield took the attack, due to Rokugan being a shockwave-based attack. Only half of the attack was slipped out, the rest Yusaku had to tank with his body. Yusaku's body felt like it was on fire, from his muscles to his bones, they were all crying out in pain. And yet the former bounty hunter refused to lose as he stood up yet again. This time with much more difficulty. The former bounty hunter unconsciously used life return to mend most of the internal damage as he walked forward. But he only got a few steps before he fell unconscious and started falling. Luffy caught him before he could drop to the floor with a wide grin on his face. You did far better than expected, Luffy said honestly. Sure, he was weak. But with that kind of determination? He won't be for long. Hope this is enough to show you what you need to do. For now, let's get you to Chopper. Yusaku had mainly asked Luffy to learn the seventh technique. The Rokuagen. It was a technique that could only be learned after learning all of the Rokushiki techniques. Or that was the rumors. But honestly, if one had Tempest Kick and Finger Pistol down, then they were on their way to learning it. And with Yusaku being a good user of Life Return, he should be good enough to learn it. Luffy had tried to teach him manually after explaining the concept and such. But it didn't help, so he took more of a practical approach to things. Luffy picked up Yusaku's body over his shoulder, and made his way towards the dungeon and to its medical area. But he had to stop right at the entrance of the dungeon. The dungeon didn't have any official entrance, but most of the crew needed it. So a good entrance that connected the outside with the dungeon was made. It wasn't anything grand just a hole that had been dug with climbing equipment attached to it so anyone could get in and out. And Luffy stopped at the dungeon entrance for a reason. Because just a moment later, Isa and Grote came out and they seemed to be a bit winded. Well, is someone in a hurry? Luffy said with some amusement. The girl panted, Big bro Captain Luffy. Big sister Nami wanted me to give you this. She said someone named Morgans is, wait. Where's they? She said trying to fish out something from her pocket. But it seemed she had lost it as the girl started to panic. I am Grote, Grote said, giving the black transponder snail to Isa, making the girl sigh in relief, before giving the tree creature a glare before pouting. Luffy chuckled at their antics. So, Morgans was calling me? Wonder what it could be? He said, rubbing his chin, before looking at Grote. Grote, buddy, can you take Yusaku to Chopper? He needs a bit of medical care. 
Grote nodded with a salute and extended his arms as Luffy gave Yusaku to him. Honestly, the little guy was quite strong, so he should be enough for the job. Isa, help Grote if needed, okay? Luffy smiled as the girl gave him a salute like Grote as they went into the dungeon. Grote had been pretty reluctant to go back in the dungeon at first, but after a few days, the young sapling had bolstered enough confidence to go back in. And honestly, the little guy had grown on him. Especially, since the small guy was giving all of his effort to learn cooking from Sanji. Ha, a chef Grote. His crew gets weirder and weirder each day. A slash N, hmm. I wonder what big news Morgans is calling for? Chapter 374 As Grote and Isa left, Luffy was left alone with the transponder snail. The young man looked around. Even with observation hacky, no one was there. Still, to make sure, Luffy jumped into the air using Jeppo to get to his destination. About a minute later he was sitting on one of the high branches of the giant jack. Giant Jack was the giant beanstalk that was in the center of Upper Yard. Going through the center of the city of Shandora, it towered over all of Skypiea. Shishishi, this has the perfect view. Luffy grinned, sitting in one of the branches of the giant tree. From up here he could see the whole island and even more. Even the tree of the old groat could be seen from here, and all of it looks small. I should bring Nami along here sometimes, she would love the view. He enjoyed the view for a few seconds before he started setting the black transponder snail up for an encrypted call. After getting that done, he waited. Moshi Moshi, big news Morgan's here. Morgan said, grinning from the other side with the video function activated. Yo, how's it been? Oh ho, certainly fine. Morgan said with a raspy voice. The bird man seemed to be in a good mood. Just today, I was able to get some confirming news on the next warlord meeting. Luffy blinked before raising an eyebrow, Oh, really? But I didn't get any call from Sengoku. You should get it by tonight, Morgan said, I just wanted to inform you first. The meeting was called on short notice, it is an urgent meeting after all. Luffy hummed. Urgent as in? Wait, did something happen? Morgan's frowned from the other side, eh, you don't know? It's because of what happened with my hawk. Luffy blinked, what happened? I thought you already knew. Morgan said, a small grin on his face, but then again, not everyone is as informed as me. Of course, the bird man preened like a peacock at his own statement. Luffy deadpanned, yeah, sure. But seriously, what happened with my hawk? Well, nothing happened yet. But from my birds, my hawk was last seen confronting Shanks for the yearly duel. Morgan said. Really? Is the battle over? Who won? Luffy asked with an eager smile on his face. The battle did end. But as to who is the winner, well it most probably is a tie. Even if someone did win, with both of them having so many battles against each other. I don't think just having one win will count for any of them. Morgan said. So I will just stick them as a tie. Though I might have to write for my hawk winning the duel, to keep up public appearances. Luffy just nodded. Something similar happened when Ace had battled against Jinbi before going after Whitebeard. They had battled for ten whole days and Ace had won the fight, before getting his butt kicked by Whitebeard. Even with the training from Rayleigh, he wasn't strong enough to win against the strongest man. Of course, Morgans had spun it off as Jinbi winning as even though the warlords might be pirates, they were world government affiliated, so they had to keep the feats of the warlords in a good light. In some way, Luffy was taking advantage of that to build up his own reputation. As for my hawk and Shanks, both were on pretty good terms. And Shanks didn't mind as long as his opponents didn't cross certain boundaries. So yet. There was no clear-cut title holder for the world's strongest swordsman. They went pretty wild on one of the islands in the New World. My birds that were on that island couldn't stand that fight and had to leave the island. Good thing that the island was a deserted one, I don't think it's in any shape to sustain any life anymore. Morgan said with a bit of a grim expression, heck the power from both swordsmen were enough to shake a couple of nearby islands as well. Monsters, I tell you. Shishishi, well, personal strength is everything in this world. Luffy said, but anyway. You wouldn't be telling me this if you didn't have any information on them. Morgans leaned in for a smile, smart one, aren't you? He said leaning back with a smug grin, I might not know who had won. But I kind of anticipated something like this happening and even though it's kind of hard to get close-up shots of their battle. 
My men were able to collect some footage from a high enough vantage point before they were pushed back, so you willing to buy it? For others, it might as well be nothing, but for Luffy it could be an important motivating asset. Just seeing two Yonko level fighters duke it out should be enough to light up some fire under Zoro and Kuina. Even Sabo and I can benefit from it, Luffy thought as on the outside he made a thoughtful gesture, how much money are we talking? And also how long is the video? You wouldn't mind showing me a preview of the product, would you? Morgan seemed to get comfortable in his seat as he took out a small mobile-like device that had a symbol of Germa Kingdom on it. It seemed Morgan's really was on good terms with Judge, but Luffy didn't care. Judge might be a sick bastard, but his inventions were quite helpful, as unlike Vegapunk he was willing to sell it for public use. Morgan's held the device in hand as he played a video. A video of Myhawk and Shanks clashing. The blur of speed along with the ground getting destroyed in each clash wasn't something you could mimic with special effects. It was the real deal. Luffy's only question was how Morgan's managed to capture such a high-speed battle. Or who the cameraman was. Saitama? But he wasn't questioning it, as he was fully focusing on the video. With there being so many devil fruits, he could see some pirates or even civilians doing freelance or full-time work for Morgan's. This is some high-quality stuff, if I do say so myself. I was only able to get it on video, cause I kept tabs on my hawk. Morgan said, his chest puffed up a bit, I knew like every year he was itching for a good battle and the war with the beast pirates would take a few more months. So I kept tabs on him. Morgan's rambled on, but Luffy was much more focused on the fight. Both of them haven't even gotten fully serious yet. But they were still terraforming the island with their clashes, the sky clouds parted, mountains got destroyed as they both went against each other. All the while they had challenging smiles on Thier faces. Monsters indeed. Chapter 375 How long did they fight for? Luffy asked, the battles between Red Hair and Hawkeye were said to last for days on end. So how long was it this time? Two days and three nights. Morgan said, I only have the footage for the first day, because they were taking things mildly, after that, the battle got so intense that my men weren't able to stay anywhere near the island. Luffy gave him a disappointed look. Hey, don't give me that look, Morgan's complained, even the marine ships that came to stand by near the island had to retreat after the first day. And they had vice admirals on those ships. Yes, yes, glorified cannon fodder. Luffy rolled his eyes. Morgan scoffed, their battle might not have affected this far into the Grand Line, but the other three Yonkos were getting pissed at how much all the nearby islands were shaking due to their fight. The last report also said that Firestorm Ace was seen on that island as well. Maybe to carry out orders from Whitebeard, who knows. It's definitely not the first time he went after them in their yearly duel. Of course, Morgan's new Ace and Luffy had a good relationship. But he didn't know how deep it was. So he just guessed that Ace and Luffy had hit it off back in Alabasta. Ha, I'm pretty sure that Moron didn't go there on Whitebeard's orders. He might as well have gone there to throw his own hat into the fight. Luffy chuckled. No wonder Ace was strong, he had a habit of popping up near where Shanks and my hawk fought to get his ass kicked. Also, Ace was trained by Rayleigh, the previous title holder for the world's strongest swordsman. So yeah, he also had some interest in that title. Definitely not like Zoro, or Kuina. But he did have some interest there. That might be the case. Morgan said, finally closing the video device. Let's talk about payment. Luffy nodded mildly disappointed that the show ended. He was definitely buying it. But then again, knowing Morgan's, the last thing he will want is money, hmm, what do you want? I need you to do a job for me, take down a pirate worth at least a hundred million, and before you say anything, this will of course boost your reputation as a new warlord. Of course, you wouldn't be able to do it now, with the warlord meeting and all, but after that, you have to do it. Morgan said, I need to boost my sales, and that's a very good way for both of us. What do you say? Luffy scratched his chin, sure, but I will choose the target, also I know you might have some ideas on it. But why is the warlord meeting happening right now? Shouldn't it be much later? Morgan's frowned, I thought you already figured it out. He said, shaking his head, it's because of my hawk, every time he and Shanks fight. Both of them usually keep themselves out of battle for a few months. Luffy blinked, what? Injuries don't take that long to heal. He said, okay maybe for the normal world people they do but for One Piece people? 
even the most severe of injuries were unless they were losing a limb healed within a week. It's kind of a tradition, they more or less party before challenging each other again. The people of the New World even dubbed it as battle season, as at the same time Kaido usually comes out of Wano to fight Whitebeard or Big Mom. But Kaido this year might not come out since he will have enough of it in the war against the Marines, but who knows really. Luffy nodded. He knew that. How else would someone fight for their title as the world's strongest if they didn't have a season for it? It was truly a thing that is done in the One Piece world. Morgans continued, the Navy has been trying to get into contact with my hawk for quite a while. Morgans said, I will say it as a hunch, but my hawk might not join the meeting or the war. Luffy blinked, opening and closing his mouth. That, that was a huge blow to the Navy's force. That's unexpected but why did my hawk join the warlords if he's not going to fight in the war for the marines? Morgans gave him a look, sure the marines might have recruited him, but it's not like they could have captured him. Taking him down would have taken a lot of resources from the marines. He was previously called the marine hunter for a reason. So it was better that he joined as a warlord. Unlike the others, he holds the position of a warlord purely based on his strength. He said, unlike the admirals, the world government can't just order warlords around. Especially not my hawk. Luffy had to agree with this one, it was kind of like a butterfly effect in some ways. In canon, my hawk was fighting with the marines against Whitebeard. But that might be just because he wanted to test his strength against the old man, and because he was bored because Shanks wasn't giving him satisfaction, wait, that sounded oddly sexual for some reason. Anyway, here with Shanks still having his dominant arm and being a contender for the world's strongest swordsman, he could see my hawk being satisfied with fighting Shanks rather than doing stuff on his own. Not to mention that Shanks and Whitebeard both had connections to Wano. So there was a good chance that both crews might want to take Wano when Kaido left for the war. And Big Mom being the wench she is might join in just because, so yeah, things might get pretty wild here. Luffy shook his head, there was still a chance that my hawk might join the war. And even if he doesn't it won't change much. For him at least. When Luffy first came to the One Piece world, the Straw Hats just went to Egghead. So he didn't know how strong the Admirals were after the time skip. But in his estimation, they should be strong enough to hold Kaido off at the least. King and Queen would be an issue. Especially King, but they shouldn't be too tough. I'm not strong enough to hold off King, but there's still time before the war. So I should be able to get to that level. But my main target isn't King to begin with, it's Kaido. So nothing much changes in the grand scheme of things. Chapter 376 Well, things are complicated. But it's a given. Luffy said, Anyway, do you have any updates on our little agents in Water 7? Morgans nodded, I didn't believe you at first that the CP9 were at Water 7. But after doing a bit of digging, you were right. They are hiding in plain sight and are so obvious that I didn't consider it. But I do wonder what they are doing there. Luffy shrugged, playing oblivious, even I don't know that one. Anyway, did something noteworthy happen there? Nope, Morgans answered, the bartender, Bluno, is still a no-show. But other than him, the other members of CP9 are still in Water 7. Luffy nodded, feeling a bit of hate for the Dordor -Dor fruit user. He did steal from him. To keep tabs on them, Luffy pinned Morgans on them, after giving each of their descriptions. But Bluno, that bitch was out there somewhere with his fruits. Luffy sighed, what's lost is lost. And news about the Aqua Laguna? He asked. Well, it usually happens once a year, so it should hit any time this week, Morgan said, still, with that warlord emergency meeting taking place, you might not be able to stay there. I don't know which island you are on but if you are anywhere near Long Ring Long Land, then it would take a while for you to reach Marine Ford. You might have to skip a few islands to get to Marine Ford. Luffy blinked, that's a bit of a rush. Morgan scoffed, this is an emergency meeting after all. Every one of the warlords were being called on short notice, if your ship isn't fast enough, the navy will be more than willing to provide a lift. Fleet Admiral Sengoku will most likely call you to get there immediately. My recommendation is going there with your crew, no need to take unnecessary risks. Ah, someone is worried about me, Luffy even winked making Morgan's gag, before both of them laughed. Be careful kid, you are my number one asset. Don't want you to end up dead, so yet. Morgans grinned, and besides, you might not know, but a lot of the marines admire you and your crew. So going there a few days earlier, 
you should be able to spend quite a bit of time there. I mean there aren't many pirates that can stay at Marine Ford. Ha, just say that you want some writing material for your newspaper, Luffy said while shaking his head. That is true as anyone other than the warlords aren't allowed to step foot in there. Just imagine how many things I can write up with this. Morgan said shamelessly. Sure sure, whatever you say. Luffy said. He was going there for other reasons as well. This will make it easier for me to go into Impel Down. Luffy also remembered something. Oh, by the way, do you have news on Vegapunk or Germa 66? Specifically about their new developments. I have some news, but it's nothing concrete. Morgan said after pondering for a while, but there are rumors that Dr. Vegapunk managed to make almost sentient robots dubbed as Pacifistas. It's true. Luffy said cutting him off, raising an eyebrow when Morgan's had a shocked expression. What? You didn't know that? They were the ones that attacked my crew back on Jaya and helped a certain someone steal some valuables from us. That's... That's big news, not that I can share it. Morgan's asked, already having a notepad in hand. But still. What do they even look like? How strong are they? I can't give you the details, but they seem to be cyborg clones of the warlord Kuma, Luffy said, not fully telling the truth, my crew had a hard time with them but they managed to escape after stealing from us. He clicked his tongue, it wouldn't have happened if I was there. Morgans nodded, buying into his half-truths. Luffy, of course, wouldn't tell him that his crew beat the bots. And even set them up for research. That was too sensitive of an information to tell anyone. That is truly amazing. Dr. Vegapunk is really ahead when it comes to technological improvements. The Birdman nodded. Well, other than the news about the Pacey Fistas, there's also a drug that's been circulating around the black market. It supposedly boosts the performance of a Zoan user, the downside is still unknown. But it's highly addictive. Luffy was surprised yet again, what? I haven't heard of that. Well, it's only been a week since the drug was released. And it's only available in the new world for now. Morgan said, but it should be spread to the first half of the Grand Line soon. Hey, who's making them? Germa 66. That is still unknown, but the seller is selling through Joker, so Doflamingo should know. Morgan said with a knowing smile, you should ask him in the emergency meeting. Luffy straight out laughed, shish ishi, that was good. But seriously you don't know who's making them. For now, no. Morgan's admitted, but it's not only me that's doing research on it. Even the world government doesn't want that kind of drug out in the open. Luffy nodded, a drug that can power a Zoan user. Chopper came to mind. But he couldn't be related. Could he? The government will likely try to stop the drug's production or buy all units for themselves. Morgan said, for now, Joker is releasing only a limited stock. So the world government is trying to buy all of them at high prices. Luffy nodded, asking a few more questions about other things before ending the call with Morgan's. Luffy could exactly see what Mingo was playing at here. Even though many people knew that the underground Joker was Doflamingo, they didn't know that Caesar Clown was working for him. The smiles hadn't been developed yet. And with the Beast Pirates ranks being filled with Zoan users, it was a power play on his part. If the product or drug was anything like Chopper's Rumble Balls that can give you a false awakening, then it would put a huge tide shift in the war. In canon, Mingo didn't need to do any of it since the world government was going against Whitebeard. So his alliance with Kaido was safe. But now, it wasn't. Because of his connection as a former world noble, Mingo couldn't just leave the warlord system. And because of fear, he couldn't go against Kaido either. So that kind of drug was a great equalizer on his part. And not to mention if Caesar Clown developed something like this, it would pave the way for other scientists like Queen, Judge and even Vegapunk to go in that route. But if that's the case, I will have my own people make that stuff. Luffy internally snorted, Chopper and Law have a lot of work cut out for them. Artificial devil fruits, artificial awakenings. I really did mess up canon, didn't I? Luffy thought with a smile on his face. Speaking of awakening, he should really focus on that aspect of his powers. It's not as if he wasn't trying. No, he was. But he needed to try harder if he wanted to set things right. Certainly, the call with Morgans was helpful in learning about a few key pieces of information, and like Morgans said, a few hours later Sengoku called in for the emergency warlord meeting. Things were moving fast and Luffy needed to plan things if he wanted everything to go his way. Of course, 
some things will be uncontrollable, but still, Luffy wanted to be careful. This might be the last night in Skypea for quite a while, hey, I will miss this place. Luffy thought looking at the moon as the soft clouds drifted in his vision. Chapter 377 The next day. The Straw Hat crew were in for a busy morning, their normally carefree demeanor replaced with a sense of urgency. Luffy led the charge with uncharacteristic focus, wanting to do everything right as the crew prepared. He barked orders to his crew as they scurried about the deck of the Going Merry, they were out in the open now. On the new port of Upper Yard, which was built not too long ago in the new city of Skypea. Both Shandarans and Ex-Angel Island residents crowded the port seeing the crew off as they hurried to prepare the Going Merry. Of course, they would come. Not only were the people very fond of the Straw Hat crew, the new port was built right near the new city of Skypea. So when the people saw the crew preparing to leave, almost all of them came to say their goodbyes. For them, the Straw Hats saved them from a great calamity and gave them a new home. The old hidden city of Shandora and Angel Island was completely destroyed by Enel. And with Enel's brutality only getting worse day by day, people started losing hope. That is until the crew of dreams came along. The people of Skypea viewed the Straw Hat crew not as pirates, but as the crew of dreams. One that gave them back their lost hope and established a new home for them. The crew even helped with building houses for them with plethora of other things. Their new home was far better than the previous one, along with a soil-rich environment. Making both parties, Shandorains and previous Angel Island residents, of Skypea grateful. Of course, the people of Skypea would miss their beloved king. Sanji had taken the title by Skypean tradition and did his duties justly, even if he gave most of his complex duties to Ganfall. The fact that such a strong warrior was their king made the people of Skypea feel secure. Especially when Sanji was adamant in helping his people with food and other daily stuff rather than abusing his powers. So they were a bit sad to see him leave. Some of them were even crying and showering the crew with gifts, meals, or other things they could for their journey. Even though Luffy and Sanji assured them multiple times that they would be back, the people of Skypea were very much sentimental about this. For them, the Straw Hat crew were their saviors, so seeing them leave was very emotional. Funnily enough, some of the well-known beauties of Skypea even wanted to honey-trap Sanji into staying, but a few even glare from Robin was enough to keep them away from him. Of course, Sanji, seeing this, made a lot of effort to not look at other women and closed himself in the kitchen to do so. Robin chuckled at him for doing that, though she was a bit sad. Unlike the others, she would be staying behind after all. She wasn't the only one either. Bartolomeo, Chopper, Popo, Penguin, Sachi and Momo were also staying in the Sky Island. Popo, Penguin and Shachi could be seen with the people of Skypea, while only Law was on the ship. After what happened with the Heart Pirates both Penguin and Shachi had taken the hit quite greatly. And unlike Law and Bapo they weren't that strong. Sure, they could fight, but after hearing that this mission might be a bit dangerous, they took it when given the option to stay in Skypea. There were doctors after all, and the people of Skypea appreciated their work greatly. Of course, they also had another reason as both of them were massive simps for winged women, especially Konis and Raki. So, yes. While they did stay to learn more about Rokushiki and possibly observation Haki from Whipper, they also had other not-so-good motivations. Though whatever their motivation might be with Bartolomeo around, the barrier user would make sure they got their daily dose of training. Chopper and Bapo actually wanted to go. But Luffy didn't want them to join on the journey just yet. While Chopper was strong, more than his canon self, with random threats popping up every now and then, it would be better to make him strong before joining in on the dangerous stuff. While Chopper was sad, he promised to use that time to master his Salong form. And as Chopper was staying back, Popo decided to do it as well. Both of them were minks. And like Chopper, Popo had problems with his Salong transformation. So both minks decided to stay back and train. Both minks had many things in common, such as love for medical stuff and so they grew a brotherly bond because of this. Chopper also planned to use the time to get better at using the Rokushiki and maybe teach Popo about it. As minks they had natural talent for martial arts so he wanted to be better at it. Robin was staying because she was much more fixated on her research on ancient history. Well, she wouldn't have minded joining. But Luffy convinced her otherwise. Someone had to stay in the dungeon, and out of everyone, only she was responsible enough for that. Luffy could have given that task to someone like Jin and take Robin with him. But he didn't. Luffy was confident in his ability to save his sister if needed. 
but he would much prefer to be on the safer side. Especially with Kuzan running loose on the first half of the Grand Line. And that's not even mentioning CP9. Sure they might not be a threat, but there were always unaccounted variables. So yes, it was better to not risk it. Bartolomeo was also staying behind in case of an emergency. He might not be physically strongest, but his barrier was very powerful. So if something did happen while they were gone, then he could guard his crewmates. Of course, he was bound to train as well. Missing a day to train was a crime for the Straw Hat crew. Or that was the joke that was going around. But then again the Sea King Momo was also training himself in his own way by fighting other larger fishes of the White Sea. He was also staying back and not returning to the Blue Sea. Luffy would have liked to get to sail with every member of his crew. But he knew for now it would be better to split up for a bit. Things might get dangerous within Water 7. So he just wanted them to be safe. Luffy didn't know if Saint Camille had other schemes set up or not. So it's better to not bring the weaker members of the crew for now. Especially since Luffy himself would not be there for Water 7. That's the reason for Going Mary's sudden design change. From far the ship looked nothing like the Going Mary. It still had its same layout and design. But the similarities ended there. Chapter 378 That's the reason for Going Mary's sudden design change. From far the ship looked nothing like the Going Mary. It still had its same layout and design. But the similarities ended there. Gone was the white elegant design with furnished wood. Now the ship was painted black and red, and with its metallic design and the front part sporting a large dinosaur head, that covered the front portion of the ship, with a ribcage going along the keel of the ship. Giving it a look that didn't even remotely look close to the Going Mary. Well it did kind of resemble it, but almost an edgy version of the Going Mary. If one looked closely, the ship's original sheep head and other design was still intact, but hidden to give it the look. I think the ship was happy or something, Luffy mused, I am pretty sure I saw our ship's clubotter man, wearing sunglasses with a cape, posing quite dramatically after its redesign, well, it looked cute rather than anything if I'm being honest. Luffy chuckled remembering how panicked she was when Luffy saw her, yup, she's definitely a straw hat that's for sure. Unknowingly the ship now looked a lot similar to Victoria Punk, kid's ship. However it was half of its size. With this, any outsiders would think of it as a random pirate ship. Well, that was their main goal to begin with. Luffy had discussed it the night prior, the going Mary needed to go incognito. There were several reasons for this as mainly the crew would need to split in Water 7. Primarily because, Luffy and a few of the members will need to go to Marine Ford. Right before Water 7 there was a sea train station, and one could catch the sea train to go to an ice lobby. From there one can easily go to Marine Ford. And Luffy wanted to use that way to get to Marine Ford. No need to bring his crew or his ship there with him. Not yet at least. So while one group would go to Marine Ford, the other would go to the Water 7 to recruit Frankie and patch up any damages to the Going Mary. And seeing as Luffy wasn't on the ship, if Saint Camille has people in Water 7, which he most probably does, he will try to attack the ship like he did before in Drum Island. That's why last night Usopp, Anchor, and those of the straw hats that were available, went and did a lot of modification of the outlook of the ship. That's why even the straw hat flag wasn't flying above the going Mary. Just a plain skull as the Jolly Roger. It kind of looked a bit bland for his taste, but oh well. This feels like Alabasta all over again. Luffy said, with a helpless smile on his face. While the crewmates he left behind in Alabasta were sad, the people of Skypiea were much more sadder. Well you are their heroes. Sabo said with a smirk on his lips, as he rested Stormforge on his shoulder, you know this happened to me before a few times, when we liberated a few countries with revolutionaries. Almost every time, people act this way, this, in a way, reminds me of why we fight the good fight. Why we do what we do. Luffy looked back at him and nodded, yeah, you are right, he said with a smile, even though it's a bit too much, I still prefer this to when we first came here. They were literally scared of their own shadows. Sabo gave a grim nod. Even when Enel was beaten, the people of Skypiea took more than a few days for them to accept the news. So for most of them, they were still traumatized by the experience. Sparky who usually had a cheery expression was a bit down as well. He was going to miss Skypiea, mainly for the great snake Nola and other animals he had befriended over this day. Speaking of Nola, the great snake was also looking at the crew with sadness in his eyes. But unlike before he wasn't the massive snake. Of course, he was big, but was comparable to the average snake, 
may be a bit larger thanks to Usopp's powers. The snake liked the size change a lot, as this made him easy to travel through the Golden City and do other stuff that he lost when he gained his massive size over the years. The snake had bonded really well with Usopp, and Sparky. So he would miss them. Speaking of Usopp, the sniper was crying his eyes out for his followers and Nola. Followers as in the kids that had posters of him and were also crying for him. Over the past few days, many people, mostly children, from Skypea had talked to Usopp about his great stories and adventures. Some kids even went as far to declare on joining the Straw Hat crew one day. Especially kids from the Shandora tribe, they were a tribe of warriors after all. And for them, the Straw Hats were the greatest warriors to ever be seen. It wasn't just Usopp either, even Kuina had a down expression on her face. She was quite popular with the kids as well, due to her showing and teaching a few kids that got up the courage to get pointers from her. Zoro had joined in on teaching as well, when Kuina wasn't around to train the kids, and roughed them up into shape. So he was going to miss them as well. The going Mary started to sail in the White Sea, with Nami's instructions while most of the crew grieved over leaving the Sky Island. Robin, Chopper, Bapo, Bartolomeo, Penguin and Sachi stayed on the port while waving the crew off. Even Momu, the Sea King was poking his head out of the water to wave at them, they were a bit sad that they had to stay back. But still, they wished for their crewmates' safe journey. Be ready everyone. Nami shouted as she navigated the ship into the White Sea. Before them was a huge fall, that would take them down to the Blue Sea. There were other safer ways to get down but where was the fun in that? Everyone hold on to something. Luffy said with a grin as he sat on the ship's figurehead. On top of the giant skeleton that covered the sheephead of the Going Merry. The crew hurried as they held on to anything to keep themselves stable. And like that the fall happened. woo hoo hoo Luffy cheered over the sound of his crew's panicked screams. The Merry flew off the end of the ramp, staying airborne for several seconds, enough time for the entire crew to float away from the deck. Just as they began to fall, Luffy gave the order, Do it Usopp. Anchor. Both the blacksmith and sniper did their part as a giant red-hot air balloon grew above the ship's sails. Ropes tied down the hot air balloon to the ship, as the ship got fully airborne. The crew tumbled to the deck, with a unified groan and complaints. While Luffy looked at the work balloon design of the going Mary. You guys are really awesome. Shishishi. Luffy said to Anchor and Usopp, who both sported grins on their faces. Other than the hot air balloon above. There were also two bone-like wings on the side to navigate through the air as the ship traveled forward. Of course, the hot air balloon wouldn't last for too long. Only around two days, but with the added wings and the crew's preparations it would be enough to cross at least two-thirds of the distance towards Water 7. Sanji had already started using his powers passively on the ship, making it move a lot faster in air without any resistance. A large fan made out of hardened maple was on the back side of the ship, pushing the ship forward. Nami had gotten a lot better with her powers, unlike others she might not be training her body, but her devil fruit was a logia. One that was unique in its qualities. That's the reason why she chose to focus on her fruit powers rather than anything else. The giant fan behind the going Mary spun, pushing the floating ship forward as it traveled through the sky. Amazing. Kobe said, looking down at the endless sea. From up above everything just looked different. It is. Jin nodded. Chapter 379 Amazing! Kobe said, looking down at the endless sea. From up above everything just looked different. It is. Jin nodded, a carefree grin on his face. Yusaku and Johnny were also appreciating the view, when Luffy came out of the captain's cabin with a bag. Yo, Johnny, you ready? Johnny looked at his captain and nodded, of course, captain. He said, puffing up his chest. Luffy grinned while the others looked at him. Oi, be careful though, Yusaku said, your abilities are amazing, but it will be a long journey. Luffy came forward and gave Johnny two bags. The bigger one he quickly tied to his back, while the small one he tied to his waist. The small one has a couple of nutrition bars inside, so if you feel depleted, chow on them. They should give you energy and recover some of your stamina. Luffy said, holding out a log pose watch, which Johnny quickly strapped to his wrist. This is an eternal pose to Alabasta, just to be safe I have added another one inside the smaller bag, along with a permanent log pose for Skypiea, it shouldn't take too long for you to go there and return. But take your time and also. Luffy held his shoulder, looking him in the eye, be careful. Johnny nodded a smile on his face, 
Sure thing, Captain. I will get back to Skypea before any one of you can make it back. Yeah, he hi hi. With that, Yusaku grew in size, turning from man to a griffin hybrid with his devil fruit powers. He looked at his crewmates one last time as they gave their goodbyes, before doing a fist bump with Yusaku before jumping down from the ship. He fell for a few seconds before opening up his wings, letting his instincts guide him as he flapped his wings going towards the opposite direction to going merry, following the eternal pose for Alabasta. Luffy looked on as the flying Zoan user of the crew moved at fast speed, faster than the speed of sound as he broke the sound barriers multiple times, clouds parting his way as he went. TCH, show off, Yusaku said with a grin on his face. He would be lying if he said he wouldn't miss him. Johnny was practically his brother while growing up, and they barely separated from each other. So he was a bit worried about him. Yusaku had always been the stronger one, until most recently so seeing Johnny go such a long distance was a bit worrying. But he trusted Johnny, and so did the captain. Or else Luffy wouldn't have given that task to him. Luffy and the crew watched as Yusako left, before the captain of the ship looked at the navigator. How long do you think he will take to reach Alabasta? With that speed, maybe six hours, but he's bound to slow down, so eight or nine give or take. Nami said, it took them two days to get from Alabasta to Jaya so even though Johnny was moving faster than the going Mary, he would still need to spend a good amount of time flying. Luffy nodded, even though he was worried, he trusted Johnny's ability, and how much time will we take to reach Water 7? Nami hummed, hard to tell, but it shouldn't take more than four days. She said, we are skipping an island so, yeah, it would take some time. You call four days long? Cricket asked a bit flabbergasted with our ships it would almost take half a month to go from Jaya to Water 7. The Monkey Brothers who were on the ship nodded. Well, our ship is just built different, Usopp said with pride patting the going Mary. Luffy just smiled, that it was. He said fondly. Even though he had to leave for Marine Ford, Luffy gave out an exact plan to what to do in Water 7. Their main priority was getting the ship in tip-top condition. Of course, they were going to build a new ship but who said that a pirate crew only needed one ship? The original Straw Hats followed their log pose from going from Skypiea to Long Ring Long Land. But Luffy's crew already had an eternal log pose for Water 7. Cricket and the Monkey Brothers had an eternal log pose for Water 7. As Cricket's crew were mostly made for exploring the deep sea, they needed to visit Water 7 at least a few times a year to get their ships checked. Also, Masira and Xiao Zhao, the Monkey Brothers were originally from Water 7. They might not be professional shipwrights but they knew their way around the ship. It was a good thing that Cricket joined the crew. Unlike others it wasn't that dramatic. When Luffy called in for a meeting and said that they would leave Skypea, Cricket requested a one-on-one -on -one talk with him. There Cricket requested Luffy to join his crew. Not as a member but more so as a crew under him. Unlike Law he wouldn't be a member of the crew. But a captain that was under him. Similar to the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. This was good in a way as with this cricket would have his own freedom and his own crew. Which was okay with him. Even though Luffy preferred quality over quantity, having more men under him was also something that shouldn't be looked down upon. And Cricket's crew were mostly explorers anyways. And now that the past of Noland wasn't holding him back, Cricket had a dream to visit every island under the sun and explore the deepest parts of the ocean. Luffy would have preferred a guy like Cricket to join the crew as a core member. As Cricket might be weak, but even with the small training he had participated in Skypea, he had shown quite a bit of potential. Especially with his swordsmanship. His use of cutlass blades was something that was truly noteworthy. But it didn't matter. Luffy had agreed to take Cricket under his banner, if he worked with the main crew for a year. That would be enough time for him to get strong and also plant some loyalty in him. Cricket viewed Luffy in a great light, mainly because like Cricket, Luffy was a dreamer. While everyone always laughed at him for believing in the old legend of Nolad, Luffy didn't. And not only that he had proved it right by finding Skypea. Also, the crew was filled with dreams like him, so Cricket had to join them. In just a week he had visited a sky island, found the city of gold and a dungeon. A freaking dungeon. This crew was different. And Luffy was a man of his word. A man that dreamed of becoming the Pirate King and being the strongest man. Cricket could follow a person like him. Chapter 380 The Going Merry sailed the sky as the day continued. Skypea was far away while the crew looked on for Water 7. Luffy had discussed the plan and the dangers of it. 
and as there was time, Luffy and the rest of the crew fell into the routine of either doing some light training or relaxing. Things were going well, too well. Wow! We are really flying! Isa said, looking over the railing of the ship, do all ships fly in the blue sea? I am Groat. Groat who was standing by her side shrugged with curiosity. But that wasn't important. What was important was the collective groan from the crew at seeing the duo. Why didn't anyone notice them? Luffy asked with a face palm, we have observation hacky for God's sake. Hey, you are the one to talk, Nami said with a sigh. The journey would be dangerous, that's the reason why a few members of the crew were left back in Skypiea. So seeing two kids board the ship without getting noticed by anyone was a feat in and of itself. Sabo chuckled, I didn't even notice them either. He said, scratching the back of his head. Should I take them back to Skypiea? What? No. Isa said, crossing her little arms. I am Groat. The tree creature doing the same. They looked like a cute duo. We won't go. Isa said firmly, while puffing out her little chest, and besides I knew if I asked up front, you guys would have rejected me like the rest of the kids in Skypiea. So we sneaked in. Sanji who just got out of the kitchen after hearing the commotion had his jaw dropped at seeing the two kids. And besides, I'm the knight of King Sanji. Isa declared, puffing up her chest, while holding the wooden lace that Groat handed over to her. And it's a knight's duty to not leave the sight of their king. I am Groat. Groat said while crossing his arms nodding, I am Groat. Oh, and the Groat is the chef, and a king needs his chef. Isa repeated after listening to Groat. It was no surprise that Isa could understand Groat. She was an exceptional observation hacky user, even though she was a kid. So she could easily understand animals. While a king does need his chef, Luffy agreed, trying to fight the smile of his face, and be serious, but you are too young to be a pirate. It's not how things go. Isa, Groat, this, you didn't do the right thing, Sanji said with a sigh before looking at Luffy, Captain, should I take them back to Skypiea? Taking them back wasn't the problem, the problem was finding the going merry after that. They had only one eternal log pose for Water 7 and so the kids were kind of stuck here. The crew had a good number of observation hacky users, and yet how both of them were able to get into the ship and hide long enough was truly a mystery. Uh, King Sanji you can't do that. She said, panicking a bit, breaking her character. But the girl coughed before straightening her back, I mean don't worry. I have thought this through. Isa said, before walking proudly towards Luffy. She halted in front of him, before pulling out her secret move. Luffy deadpanned, really, puppy eye. He said, before bursting into laughter, shishishi. You guys are bold, sure you guys can stay. Usopp, Nami it seems you guys will have to look after them in Water 7. Usopp laughed as well. And he wasn't the only one as the crew joined in at the scene. Not all things go as planned. Isa, come here you cute ball. Nami cooed before appearing near Isa and picking her up, before rubbing her cheeks with the smaller girl. While Luffy might be immune to the small girl's cuteness attack, others weren't that lucky. Groat grinned and gave Isa a thumbs up, which the girl returned. Luffy chuckled before he patted the small treat creature, while the small thing protested. There were a few chuckles and laughter for the new members of the ship, before Kuina asked a key question. So, if Isa and Groat are joining the ship, are they cabin boys or girls? She said before a smile tugged on her lips as she looked at Law, if so, then congratulations, Law, you have got two new members in your rank. Oi! The doctor complained, while others laughed. Even with how serious everything gets, they were the straw hat crew, so there was bound to be laughter everywhere they go. A slash N, the going merry looks kind of like kids ship, but smaller. The original Going Mary's design is still intact underneath, so don't worry. Also, those who are going to Water 7 will of course wear disguises to not get connected to the real straw hats. So people who stayed back in Skypiea. Bartolomeo, to guard the dungeon base and the crew members in case of an emergency, and learn Rokushiki, an observation hacky while training with the warriors of Shandora. Chopper, to get better at life return and learn other Rokushiki techniques. Popo, to train so long form. Robin, research the ancient language and learn the Rokushi techniques as well. Remember Robin is scary, she's the only human other than Koala who learned the basics of Fizman Karate. So she has some really good potential there. Shachi. Penguin. Momu. 
Johnny isn't in Skypea as he is going to Alabasta to run an errand for Luffy. Any guesses what's he carrying back to Alabasta? Hint, it's for Vivi. Anyway, I apologize for not uploading for quite a while. But I had things going on. And also rereading One Piece Water 7 and Ennis Lobby Arcade took a lot of time. Especially with generating original ideas. I have some good ideas for this arc and hopefully I will able to execute them in a manner that's noteworthy. For now, have a great day. Bye. Chapter 381 The Going Merry went along lazily, as it flew, or sailed, above the clouds. Its speed was faster than any normal ship as it went towards its destination. Time passed and other than sitting around and doing some light training most of the crew had nothing else to do. Kobe and Usopp were playing tag with Isa and Grote, while Kuina was sitting around in one corner reading a book. Sanji and Hachin were cleaning up after lunch, and already planning for dinner. Sparky could be seen in the sky running along with Yusaku along the going merry. Both of them used Jeppo as the two pirates exchanged blows, training. After seeing Johnny get that strong, Yusaku also focused a lot on training so that he could catch up. He knew it would take a while before he was able to get his fruit, but there were other ways to get strong. Luffy and Sabo were also training, but more so in speed as the rubber man tried to play catch up with the lightning man. Jin, Law, Anchor, and Cricket were on the deck playing cards, and from the looks of it, Jin and Law were winning, while Anchor and Cricket looked really miserable. On the side, Zoro was taking a nap, making use of the free time. Nami was also relaxing while finishing up her work on the map of Skypiea. She was a bit sad that they were going to skip one island. But when they have time, they would certainly take the time to visit Long Ring Long Land. From the logbook of Tsurera Oikawa, there were multiple stories of how the chain of ten islands were, and their unique weather pattern. The island was big, and shaped like a crown and who knows what kinds of treasures were there. Mapping the island would have been a treat. But alas not everything goes as planned. Right then. pre 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 pra pre 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 pra pre 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 pra The black transponder snail on the ship buzzed. Nami stood up and went to the snail and looking at the caller, she smiled knowing who it was. She cut the call off, before calling Luffy, while she set up the black transponder snail for an encrypted call. After that, she called back the caller and waited. Moji Moji Vivi here. Vivi said, while a video projection of her came out as she waved at Luffy and Nami. Right as she was doing that a white snake crawled up looking at the transponder snail, and was confused, looking back and forth. White Furry looked at the snail and then at Vivi. The princess chuckled, no, it's not food. And yes they are Luffy and Nami. Hearing that White Fury perked up and hissed happily at her friends. Well, you guys have been doing well. Luffy asked, anyway, did Johnny already make it to Alabasta? Vivi pouted, you don't call me for a whole day and the first thing you ask is about Johnny. She said, crossing her arms underneath her breasts, it seems you don't care for me at all. Luffy chuckled while Vivi grabbed her end of the transponder snail and moved it showing Johnny. The pirate seemed to be stuffing his face with royal delicacies. Seeing his captain, he comically gulped down all the food, struggling a bit. Ahem. I made it captain. Luffy chuckled, it seems so. Did you have any trouble while going there? Nah, Cap, I got this, Johnny said flexing his biceps, but I did get hungry though, even with all the energy bars, it seems flying consumes a lot of calories. Luffy nodded, it's probably because he wasn't fully used to his powers, which was making him burn extra energy. But he should get better, something similar happened when Jin had his powers as well. Eat then get some sleep here, Luffy said, you can hang around Alabasta for a while before you want. You don't need to return to Skypea, immediately. Johnny nodded, I might take you up on that offer, he shamelessly said, I want to use my powers a bit, you know hunt some pirates and stuff, and also pal, Vivi's bodyguard, or royal guard, or whatever his title is, man, titles are weird. Anyway, his powers should be similar to mine, so he should be able to help me a bit. Especially with the flying part. Luffy nodded. With that Johnny discussed a few more things about the bounty hunting organization CDs, courting death services, before returning back to his food. Even White Fury joined in with Johnny as both of them ate. Vivi left them be and went into her own room, as she spoke to Luffy and Nami from the other side. Anyway, did you get the bag from him? Luffy asked. Vivi nodded and put the transponder snail on the table, before going away from the view for a few seconds before returning with the bag. 
she placed the bag on the table with a loud thud before looking at the transponder's nail. This is quite heavy, what's even in there? Vivi asked. Oh, nothing much, just a hundred kilograms of gold and a devil fruit. Nami answered with a smirk. Vivi's eyes comically widened before she zipped the bag open, before a shit ton of gold was dumped into her. Almost burying her in it. And on top of it was a devil fruit. Usopp's powers were amazing in some ways. With it, they were able to stack a lot of gold together and reduce their weight. But after the bag was opened, the powers got cancelled, as Usopp gave that as a condition to return to its original size. Both Luffy and Nami chuckled while Vivi got herself out of the rubble. She was going to complain when she noticed the devil fruit. It wasn't her first time seeing a devil fruit, but it was certainly amazing. Like it? Luffy asked, musing at her reaction, it's for you. You sure? Didn't Usopp want the fruit? Vivi asked. They had discussed it before the night prior about giving her that fruit. Luffy nodded, yes he did, but he already has a fruit. And while I am all for making a new devil fruit weapon, it's a bit complicated. Something about needing a special weapon. And well, after thinking a bit, I think this fruit should suit you the best. He said, I discussed with Usopp as well, and he wouldn't mind giving you the fruit, funny thing is, when I brought up the subject about the fruit last night, he independently suggested you or Kuina for the fruit. And I spoke to Kuina as well, she doesn't want the fruit. So, go on and eat the fruit, Nami said kindly, but all of them knew why it was. Vivi looked at the fruit and nodded before biting into the fruit, gagging at the bad taste. Both Luffy and Nami laughed, Vivi didn't see Nami eat his fruit, so she took a large bite out of it, and regretted it due to the horrible taste. They spoke for a while, discussing the gold and the fruit. They were all for Vivi and White Fury. Even though Vivi didn't need the gold, being a princess and all, but as a member of the crew she also had her share. And also White Fury needed her portion. Even though she was going to most likely build a nest with the gold, and not use it any other way. Vivi also tested out her new powers a bit before going over other stuff that's been happening after they left Alabasta. It seems after the world government's failure at controlling Crocodile, they were going full force in Alabasta. Setting up a base in Alabasta to keep the island safe. And while any other country would have appropriated the help, the people of Alabasta didn't. They were still distrusting of them. And with Luffy's bounty hunting organization at play, they weren't needed. There were other problems, but Alabasta was doing well. The same for Drum Kingdom or Sakura Kingdom. The new King Dalton had visited Alabasta recently and set up some political contracts between both nations. There were many more improvements the countries needed, but they were on the correct route. After talking with Vivi some more, the call ended. Soon the night came, and after dinner, the Straw Hats called it a day. The Going Merry was still sailing through the sky as they went forward. Chapter 382 Two more days passed and the Going Merry was now sailing on the blue ocean. As the crew was nearing Water 7, Luffy decided to take the ship down, rather than gathering any attention. It took a bit of an effort to land the ship, but they did it without damaging any part of the Going Merry. Even though the ship was reinforced with steel, it was better to be careful. Time passed as the crew sailed towards their destination. Oi! There's a frog doing the front crawl off the starboard bow. Jin said, attracting the attention of the rest of the crew. Really? I am Groat. Isa and Groat yelled excitedly as they raced to the railing to see it. Don't be ridiculous, Usopp chastised. Frogs can't do that. Okay, I take it back. Guys, there's a frog doing the front crawl. The sniper yelled. Oi, that's why I said. Jin complained. Sure enough, a giant frog with black hair and scars covering its body was doing the front crawl through the water. It swam like a professional swimmer as it went forward. A frog. Cricket asked, then it must mean we are near. Luffy internally nodded, follow that frog. Aye aye captain. Kobe said. The ship turned to two o'clock and began pursuing the amphibian. And before long they found themselves on a lighthouse, getting introduced to a few new characters. Kokoro the old mermaid, Chimney her granddaughter, and the cat which was actually a rabbit gone They were a good trio of people who were happy to show around the station and point them at Water 7. But they became a bit cautious when they found out that Luffy was a warlord. It was a bit disheartening that some people would be more cautious about government-affiliated pirates than regular ones. So, unlike Cannon, she didn't give the recommendation letter to Iceberg. It was sad in a way, but understandable. 
with how much Tom had suffered because of the world government it was quite practical that old lady Kokoro was hesitant to trust them. With Luffy and the crew finally making it to the station, the first part of the journey was over. You know, be careful out there, Nami said, from the ship, as Luffy gave a nod. Standing in the station with a few of his crewmates, oh, and don't forget to steal something from me. She finished with a wink, as Luffy laughed. Sure sure. Luffy said, before turning to Usopp, who was also at the ship, take care of Mary Usopp, and also don't forget to recruit a shipwright. You don't have to worry, Usopp said while puffing his chest, I will do it without any trouble. Luffy smiled, not even questioning if that was a lie or not. They were the Straw Hat crew, Treble was their middle name. Wait. Are we Team Rocket or something? Luffy thought with amusement. Don't worry, boss. I will take care of him, Jin said, jabbing a thumb towards himself while ruffling Usopp's hair, making the sniper irritated. Which went on as both Jin and Usopp started wrestling in a cloud of dust, causing Isa and Groat to cheer for them. Yusaku tried to stop them, but got tangled up instead. Luffy just laughed, I'll miss you bunch. He snorted before giving Anchor and Cricket a nod. He also gave the only doctor on the ship a grin, which Lore returned the gesture by tipping his hat, stoically. While some might get a bit irritated about his lack of reaction, Luffy found it funny. Kind of like the emo cool kid that didn't speak to anyone cause he was too emo. Luffy laughed internally. Good going Luffy, now we have an emo doctor, a shy doctor and a reindeer doctor, oh there's also the two assistants. Hey, my crew's having a doctor's monopoly here. Wonder if I can bag Marco as well. Luffy shook his head, even Shanks had been trying to bag that birdie for a while but the said bird is too stubborn to leave his papa's nest. After that, all of the crew members including the kids said their goodbyes as the ship started sailing. Even though Luffy had explained what to do in Water 7, he was still a bit worried. But Water 7 needed to happen, he didn't expect the sudden warlord meeting. The importance of recruiting Frankie and also building a new ship, wasn't something he could postpone. While the Going Mary was a good ship, it wasn't meant for the rough waters of Grand Line. And unlike how Luffy had expected, Usopp fully agreed. They weren't going to throw away the Going Mary, but they needed a bigger ship for the crew. One that was meant to take them across the seas. Luffy, Sparky, Kobe, Zoro, and Kuina stood on the platform of the station as they waved their goodbyes to the rest of the crew. Sabo was also with them, but he was already wearing his invisible watch to keep himself hidden. Usually, the Germa invisibility watch only lasted for an hour before it needed to recharge. But with Sabo's power, he could use it for longer periods of time. And not only that after eating the lightning logia fruit, Sabo had become better at hiding his aura. And along with the Germa invisibility watch, it was very hard for anyone to find him. Sabo didn't need to go to Marine Ford. But he was going there to test out how far he could hide from the Marines, if his powers were able to even fool the admirals, then in time when they attacked Marajoa, he would be ready. But if that didn't work, he could always change targets and try to infiltrate Impel down. Ivankov should be in there. Even though there was no solid information, Luffy encouraged Sabo to go in there and find out. Nami steered the going merry away heading to Water 7 while Luffy made a call to Sengoku. They needed a ride to Enice Lobby and the sea train was the best option. Meanwhile, Sabo took to the sky, going above the clouds as he waited. Chapter 383 Time passed and the going merry finally made it to Water 7. But that was not before some final modifications were done to the ship. It took a few hours for Usopp and his group to reach Water 7 from the station. And Usopp couldn't just stay still for all the time. A new flag flew on the going Mary, a Jolly Roger, depicting a skeleton with an unusually long nose wearing a cap, having a slingshot and a rifle instead of the crossbones. It wasn't the Jolly Roger either, even the mainsail had been painted with Usopp's personal Jolly Roger, which Jin very profusely protested. Nami found it hilarious and in a way, if they really were going to put on an act of being a random crew, they should put some effort into it. In Usopp's opinion, Luffy was lazy just putting a random ordinary Jolly Roger on the ship. Where was the fun in that? Usopp is the mustache and beard really necessary? Yusaku asked, you even had me shave my whole head. Yusaku who always sported a buzz cut was now bald, a bald man whose head shone in the sun. Yusaku wasn't fully opposed to the idea of going bald, but he didn't get why he needed to wear a fake beard and a comically long mustache. Isa and Groat were behind the former bounty hunter, while both of the kids were polishing some baby oil to make his head extra shiny. 
his new name Yotaro. Usopp solemnly nodded, unlike others, he wasn't laughing either, as he was too much into the game. Yes, Yotaro, we need to make ourselves look different. He said, wearing a green mask that easily let his long nose pass through. He also wore a cape that had the enigma of Sogging written on it, we can't be connected with the real crew, or all the effort is for naught. Jin grunted, as he was also a dark color headgear, one that knights wore. Usopp initially wanted to give him a mask, but as he was a close quarters fighter, giving him the knight's headgear was the best option. Especially if he had to go full Zoan or half Zoan. Usually, Zoans have the passive ability to stretch and morph their clothes when they go into their transformation, so this way, they won't get connected to the straw hats. Just as long as Jin didn't go full Zoan. Most half Zoans were kind or random, so it was tough to find people based on that. And besides, even though Jin had his fruit for a while, no marines actually ever saw him using his abilities. As a veteran pirate, he was much more cautious about letting others see his cards. So other than wearing the dark-colored knight helmet he also wore a cloak that was similar to the beast pirates, with large horns protruding out of the shoulder. I really hate the helmet, Jin said, but I do like the cloak, makes me feel like a supervillain. Muhahaha. Usopp sweat dropped, seeing Jin play into his role. But then again was Jin even acting? Whatever you say, Jintaro. He said. Anchor and Cricket wore similar looking beards, but unlike Yusako's, they were white giving them the appearance of old men. They even had to wear grey-coloured afro, completely selling the old man image. Jin was the one to give the idea, and Usopp completely agreed. Nami went along just for the sake of it. But after getting puppy dog eyes from Isa and Grote they reluctantly agreed. They also had to change their names to Archie, and Cricky. Their alibi was, the two brothers didn't go along. Funny thing was they actually didn't get along. You look stupid, Archie, Cricket said, looking at the smith. We look almost the same, dumbass, Anchor grunted. Or should I say Cricky? Oi, oi, act your age, Jin said with a smile underneath his helmet, bend your back a bit, and use a walking stick. You guys are in your sixties. Foo. Both of them paused when Nami coughed, remembering that Isa and Grote were with them. Screw you. Jin just laughed, before someone else came out of the cabin, it was Law, looking good, doctor. Law on the other hand looked completely different. He was wearing a doctor's mask and head cover, blue ones that they wore while doing surgery, while wearing a doctor's gown and gloves to completely hide his tattoos. He even had fake round glasses to give him the look of a sincere and yet harmless doctor. He also disguised his sword to look like an umbrella. His name, well, he didn't want a name. And just told everyone to call him doctor. Your compliment is appropriate, he said with a formal tone, playing into his character as he fixed his glass. He also had a clipboard in his hand, to sell the look of a professional and harmless doctor. If you have any medical queries, do let me know. He said, while pushing his fake glasses up, as they shined with reflective light. Isa and Grode had stars in their eyes, but that wasn't because of law. No, it was because of Hatchin. Hatchin looked also quite different, his usually pink skin was now yellow, sporting tattoos of foods on them, with two black mustaches trailing down from his face. And a construction hat to cover his head. As an octopus fisherman, he could somewhat change his skin color to camouflage under the sea. And he had been honing that ability for quite a while, and that's how he was able to change his skin color. His new name was actually his pet name, Hatchy, and his alibi was that he was a octopus so an user. Do I even need to have a disguise, I'm not even going to leave the ship. But, you look so cool. Isa said. I am Groat. Groat agreed. On the side, Law was drawing circles on the ground with a sad expression. Mumbling something about how he put effort into his own disguise. Hatchin just laughed, feeling a bit shy. Okay then. Hey. Why don't I get a hat? Yusaku complained. My head is way too shiny now. It was true Yusaku's head was literally shining like a mirror. Seeing this, others couldn't stop laughing. Men, always complaining, Nami said. She was the only one who had a single change, as she used her maple powers to change the color of her hair from orange to black. She even styled her hair differentially, also wore a black domino mask on her eyes making her look quite the stunning beauty. The change was simple, but it was hard for anyone to find similarities if they didn't look very carefully. And her new name was Moni, which she liked very much. 
especially since it rang with money. The Monkey Brothers, Masira and Xiao Zhao were the only ones that didn't go through any disguise, even little Isa was wearing a black domino mask similar to Nami's with a wooden guitar on her back. Of course, the wooden guitar was Groat himself, who morphed his body that way to change shape. Though she really didn't need to change her appearance much. As unlike others, she was just a kid and hardly anyone would pay attention to Isa. Still to keep up with the theme she put some features similar to one Nami was using. Giving her the appearance of a mini version of Nami. The navigator would be around them all the time, and they would hardly leave her supervision. Even though Water 7 was a beauty, currently it was a dangerous place for the Straw Hats. So they needed to be careful. Oh, by the way, Big Bro Usopp, what is your new name going to be? Isa asked. Usopp crossed his arms, and grinned, so King, the king of the snipers. The going Mary sailed on its own pace as it navigated through the sea, the sun set down, and in a few hours, the group of straw hats were at the shipwright city of Water 7. Chapter 384 At the same time, Water 7. Keiku sighed as he walked out of the Galley Law Company office. Inside, Icebig was having a heated argument with a pirate about the practicality of a design. Hey, new star pirates, always thinking they are some hotshot. I mean why does he even want to put a head of a dinosaur in front of the ship, that's just plain ugly Keiku thought, as he walked through the hall of Galley Law. People passed him, while some greeted him with smiles, others gave him high fives, and fist bumps. In all honesty, he will miss this place. He had been living in this city for five years. Five years of going undercover to find some fictional blueprint for an idiot who got into the high ranks because of dear old daddy. But while Keiku didn't particularly like his boss, Things were going to change now. Shpondam had called all of the undercover agents back to Nice lobby. And from what Luchi had hinted, he wasn't doing it willingly. Someone from the upper ranks more influential than Shpondam had called the CP9 team back. Someone that almost all the Cypher Paul agents knew of, and had fear and respect for. While others were a bit hesitant, he was a bit excited about it. Even though he liked the place, it lacked any kind of excitement. And well, he wouldn't be jumping off rooftops if he wasn't an adrenaline junkie. Walking through the corridor, Keiku found Polly arguing with Lulu about his gambling debt, and asking more like begging him to give him some money. Boss, I'm calling it a night, Keiku said, bringing Polly's attention to him, the new pirate customers are a bunch of pricks. Anyway, I'm not feeling so well, so. Polly quickly came over, and placed his hand over his shoulder, of course, of course, but can you give me some money? Keiku deadpanned, before Luchi smacked the backside of Polly's head. Hatori, the pigeon who was on his shoulder spoke up, you are the new vice president of Galley Law, at least try to act like you have some respect. Why you, Luchi? With that, Polly tried to fight off Lucky, but the undercover agent was holding him down with one hand. Keiku chuckled as he walked past Luchi, not reacting as the other agent slipped a small piece of paper in his hands. Keiku yawned playing fatigued as he stretched his arms going through the door. He came out walking, before quickly taking pace, and jumped out of the rooftop free-falling towards the ground. Yamakaze, they called him. Keiku smiled, a genuine one, he felt free when he was like this. Free. The Cypher Paul agent shook his head before he twisted mid-air, and flung his clothes back. Revealing his black suit jacket underneath, he took out his cap. With his agent suit on, he used Jeppo to fly through the sky going towards the hinted location. He moved in a way that was very hard for anyone to see. The wind blew past him as he moved, and before long he was already there. Califa was already there, so only Rob Lucci needed to come. Bluno should have also been with them in Water 7, but a few months ago, someone from the world nobles needed his powers. To run some errands of sorts. But from what he was hearing Bluno failed one of the tasks and he was doing some kind of punishment. Keiku felt bad for his friend. But that's just how it was. That's how it's always been. You fail at something, you face the consequence of it. Keiku just wished Blunio was at least alive. He was like his family after all. Other than each other, no other had their back in their home island. Time passed and Keiku, Califa and Luchi made their way to an ice lobby. Using Jeppo to cross the hundreds of kilometers of distance and before long they were inside the Tower of Justice. Five years it had been that long. Keiku missed this place in some ways. The Nevernight Island of Nice Lobby, where it was always daytime. It was ironic in some ways, 
for spies like them who always tried to hide in the shadows their main base was here, where there was no shadow. Keiku and the others entered the building. And all of the CP9 members were here. It wasn't just the three, Jabra, Kumadori, and Fukuro were there as well. Shbandam, their chief, was pacing back and forth behind his desk, clearly nervous. But who could blame him? Even Keiku and the other members who were Cypher Paul were on edge, but unlike the man-child in front of them, they knew how to keep his emotions in check. Suddenly the air shifted in front of them, and all of the men inside the room prepared for the worst, but when the air suddenly became a door, all of them sighed in relief. It was just Bluno. But they were wrong. It wasn't just Bluno. Suddenly, as the door opened, all of the members present felt a sudden chill run down their spine. The air was hard to breathe, it was suffocating and fear was up their throat. It wasn't hacky or anything else, no it was pure bloodlust. The intent to kill. The Cypher Paul agents such as Luchi and Jabra wanted to go into their hybrid forms immediately. But they were frozen in place, as if their body wasn't listening to their commands. An aura of intimidation was pressing down on them. As Bluno opened the door, a man walked out. Dressed in his all-white suit, with the white marine coat draping over his shoulder, walked out a man who was one of the key members of Cypher Paul Zero. The man had a kind smile, sporting an eye patch on his left eye that almost glowed red. He was wearing a black vest with a white dress shirt, dress pants, and formal shoes. The man was old, and yet with his black combed back hair, no one would even think of him as a man beyond his forties. Another unique feature of the man was his right arm, which was replaced by a robotic one. A tragedy for a swordsman like him. Still, the man had four swords on his waist, two on each side. Spadroon swords, thin swords that looked grand on its design, and yet powerful. Even from the sheath one could tell all of them were of good quality. As the man walked forward the Cypher Paul agents struggled to breath, Shpondam on the other hand was downright knocked out, foaming from his mouth. As Bluno closed the door, the man broke into a light chuckle, breaking off the pressure. Now isn't this interesting? You guys are certainly more promising than the other batches of CP9 units. The man said, handing off his marine jacket to Bluno, who held it taking a step back. The man looked at each of them. Eyeing them one by one, all the while the kind smile remained on his face. Like everyone, he held his eyes on Keiku for a moment before nodding. Now, where's your chief? Shbandam was it. Where is he? He asked kindly. Chapter 385 now, where's your chief? Shbandam was it. Where is he? He asked kindly. All of them stood there awkwardly for a moment, all looking at the side, where Shbandam was foaming from his mouth and on the floor. Suddenly the pressure in the room pressed down again, the old man promptly looked at Khalifa, kick him in the balls. I'm sorry, sir. The man smiled, the pressure in the room increased a little bit, did I stutter? We can't have an agent of justice sleeping on his work. Khalifa moved her body even before she could realize it, kicking Spanam in the balls, planting him on the wall, and fully waking him up. M my balls. Heck but Shpandam stopped midway when a sword was buried at the right side of his face, fully waking him up, while blood poured down his cheek. Only then did the pressure of the room disappear. K King Bradley. Sir, it's an honor to meet you. He said with some struggle. The man chuckled, oh, please don't use that old title. Just call B. Bradley instead. I might be your superior, but you young ones don't need to be all straightforward in front of me, he said kindly, showing a smile that looked quite genuine, but I do hope I never see you sleeping again at work. Youngsters should be filled with passion for justice, only then can we keep the status quo. Shbandam nodded like a chicken, his pants already wet. Was it from fear or Colifal's kick, no one knew. Though, Keiku was certainly sure luck if found much amusement in that not that it was any different for him. Good, Bradley smiled, again, though his only eye hardened as he looked at him, now give me the full report of your mission. And for your own sake, I do hope that I find it noteworthy. Unlike others I need a valid reason as to why you have been holding up a Cypher Paul 9 unit for five years. Shpandam gulped and nodded, standing up with much difficulty as he walked on wobbly legs and started giving the report. All the while Bradley listened carefully, while reading the report. Unlike the other Cypher Paul units, CP9 was special. All CP9 members were trained from birth to fulfill their roles in serving for the greater good. They were trained in assassination, espionage, and combat. 
there was a reason why the CP9 unit remained as a legend to the outside world. Every few years CP9 agents would get replaced, either promoted or demoted depending on their performance. But it couldn't happen to their own team, as Spondam had been hogging their full teams on Wild Goose Chase for five years. While Bluno, Lucky, Keiku and Califa were working undercover in Water 7, the other CP9 agents were also working under Spondam. And Keiku was being honest here, they rarely did any good work. The unit as a whole was getting underutilized by Spondam. So he was bound to get caught someday. The world government might have corruption, but there were inquisitors in place to keep things in check. And the man in front of them was one of them. The man standing in front of them was former Admiral King Bradley. A man who had served the Navy for decades, before retiring from his position. Now he was a world government agent, a chief member of the highest Cypher Paul unit. A man who had one of the highest authority when it came to Cypher Paul. It was just Spondam's bad luck that he got sent here as an inquisitor to investigate. The man was known for his wrath after all. Keiku heard rumors about this man, about his time working as a marine admiral and they were not pleasant. And, it made Keiku wonder on why a free man like him joined the world government. There was no way for a CP9 agent to be free. Most of them had seen what happened to the few traitors, and no one wanted that. The world government was strict and cruel in setting examples. He was a marine. And even a marine had more free will than a Cypher Paul agent. Unlike us they are free. They have vacations, family and even retirement, the only thing we get is either a carrot or a stick, Keiku mused internally. But then again, where will I go? Where can I go? Keiku's thoughts were cut off when King Bradley spoke, he looked stern, his expression unreadable, so you're telling me that, for five years you have been holding out our best agents on a wild goose chase. I I. Do not speak, Bradley said, cutting him off, a frown on his face, I will say this once and once only. Never question my orders, and never cut me off, or be prepared to face my wrath. He looked around the room, unlike before he wasn't actively trying to drown them in killing intent. But even then every one of the CP9 agents knew by instinct that King Bradley was getting angry, almost wrathful. Their instincts told them not to do or say anything that would make the beast unleash his wrath. Do you understand, soldiers? Sir, yes sir. All of the CP9 agents said at once. It almost felt like they were back at the training grounds again, with drill sergeants chewing them out. Good, he said, before sighing and massaging the bridge of his nose, I'm getting too old for this. He said before clapping both of his hands, I have decided. As my authority as a member of Aegis, I declare this mission void. CP9 agents are to be handed under my jurisdiction, and Chief Officer Spondam is deemed. But Spondam cut him off, H. Hey, you can't do that. Bradley looked coldly at Spondam, deceased. Wah! But Spondam couldn't even finish his sentence as his head was sent rolling. His eyes were still wide when former Admiral Bradley sheathed his sword. A thin trail of blood came out of his neck area, before his body fell to the floor, head rolling forward. CP9 clear out the body from the office, blood usually sours my mood. He said walking over the dead body. No one said anything as Fukuro and Kumidori came forward, taking out black zipper bag and dumping the body inside. Bluno on the other hand was already mopping the floor of the blood. King Bradley walked forward and stopped at the large winds of room. From here one could see the whole of Ennis lobby. Quite the beautiful sight isn't it, all uniformed and straight. The last time I came here was around a decade ago, time sure does fly. He said to himself before turning towards them with his kind smile, I presume I got a bit overboard. I was only planning on dismembering him for his lack of usefulness, but... The older man sighed, anyway, who is the one that's in charge after that moron? Even though Jabber wanted to nominate himself, all of them looked towards Lucci, as the world government agent stepped forward. Ah. Rob Lucci, I have been told you are a man of many talents, he said smiling, now even though I want nothing more to take all of you back and give out proper missions. Better utilize all of your talents, I can't do that, you see the world government has wasted a lot of resources on this fool. So this mission needs an end. Bradley continued, I don't care if the mission succeeds or not, but the mission needs a closer. So we have to do things fast, so I'm asking you, agent. What would you do? He asked looking at Lucci. Lucci seemed to straighten up a bit. Even from here, Keiku could feel all the remaining agents in the room were eager to see things happen. Rarely Spondam ever asked for their suggestion. So for King Bradley to do it, 
was quite the development. Keiku could respect that. And other agents also shared his testament. King Bradley continued, an air of charisma around him, speak your mind soldier. You have been undercover for almost five years for this mission, you are bound to notice something about odd about the target. Thank you, sir. Luchi started, if I'm being honest, it's a hunch, but one that I'm sure of, while working under Icebag I have gotten to know him on a personal level. The man has plans. If he does have the blueprints of Pluton, then he knows like his teacher Tom, the government might try to kill him. Icebag might be a nonchalant person, but he is a cautious man. So either he doesn't have the blueprint or someone else has it. Interesting, Bradley said, taking the teacup off of Bluno's hand who had just returned. He sipped the tea, and said, go on. From our independent research, Luchi said, indicating to Keiku, and Califa, we have discovered that there was also another student that worked under Tom. Cuddy Flam was his name, the boy presumably died under the sea train when he tried to stop Tom's execution. Bradley chuckled, a hot-headed one, wasn't he, hey, young stars? He said, smiling, brings me back to my heydays. A few years ago, someone had come to Icebag under the same name, Luchi said, at that time, we didn't think much as Icebag just waved it off, but after doing a bit of research, I can almost certainly say that it's Frankie. Bradley nodded, this Frankie character, how certain are you about this? Luchi steeled his resolve, I am almost sure, this man doesn't have a past. We couldn't trace back his past, and not only that his shipwright skills are far from average. And some of his inventions are in line with the things Cuddy Flam had created. King Bradley nodded, standing up, well, great then, he said, walking forward and clapping Luchi on the shoulder, giving him a firm shake, do whatever it takes, I only give you 24 hours to either get the blueprints of Pluton. Burn down Water 7 if you have to, get me those papers. And if you can't, then don't worry. I do not care if this mission either succeeds or not, but this needs closure. With that King Bradley passed Luchi as he walked towards Bluno, oh, and also fake Spondam's death. Spandine is one of my good friends and I hope nothing will leave the room, he said with a smile, Spondam for all he's worth was a government agent, so putting death on some pirate should do the trick. Yes sir, Luchi said while King Bradley walked away, stopping in front of Bluno as he opened the door, letting him pass through. Chapter 386 Chapter 386 Water 7 The going merry in its unrecognizable form finally entered into Water 7. Other than leaving behind Hachin and Yusaku, most of the crew went out to look around Water 7. As it was night time the city of Water 7 looked very appealing with lights and other attractions. Cricket and Anchor went together along with Masira and Xiao Zhao, the monkey brothers, they more or less went out exploring rather than anything. Anchor wanted to visit the local weapon shops to restock on a few materials, while Cricket intended to temporarily hand over his own crew's duties to Masira and Xiao Zhao. As per Luffy's condition, Cricket had to journey with the Straw Hats for a year or so, and in the meantime, his crew will be without their captain. Most of Cricket's crewmates were more or less ship scavengers and explorers rather than pirates. And the funny thing is, other than Cricket no other member of his crew had any significant bounties. The Monkey Brothers did have bounties on their heads, but they weren't that famous. So leaving them alone wouldn't be a problem. Especially, as they intended to work under CDs. Luffy's Bounty Hunting Organization. They would have to forge new identities, but it should be manageable. So Cricket went and explained the situation to Masira and Xiao Zhao so that they could relay the information to the rest of the crewmates. Only Cricket will be joining the Straw Hats for their journey. Both Masira and Xiao Zhao were weak, compared to the other members of the Straw Hats and Cricket knew bringing them along would only put them in danger. Even Law had almost all of his crew back in Skypiea. While Luffy might be a dreamer like him, his crew was also a trouble magnet, and he didn't want Masira and Xiao Zhao to suffer because of this. While that was happening, Nami was out with Isa and Grote, out there shopping. Grote was disguised as a guitar at first, but after buying some clothes, Grote was able to return to his humanoid form and walk together with them. Both the kids were excited about shopping and Nami shared that sense. She always was a minimal spender, but with the straw hats having so much gold and other commodities, she was letting herself a bit loose on the buying spree. Still she would haggle over the prices before buying anything. And the kids were just happy to be there, checking out new clothes, and foods all around the small island. Usopp, with Jin, were looking for Frankie and intended to check out Galilaw later on. 
Luffy had explained the importance of recruiting Frankie, and about his skills. So both of them were out there gathering information about him. Which wasn't that much, most normal people would freak out and run away when asked any questions about Frankie. And the few pirates that Usopp and Jin did question were also looking for Frankie cause he either stole from them or they had some grudge to settle. So they weren't getting much there. Still, they did get some useful information, mainly about the location of Frankie House, but nothing much. Usopp sighed at one point, and said that it would have been much easier if Robin was here. She was very good at gathering information after all. Even Jin had to agree with that one. Law was the only member to directly go into Galley Law but he was mostly there for personal reasons. While he respected his new crew for their own effort in finding a good shipwright and fixing their ship, Law was there to find out if Polar Tang could be fixed or not. His old ship-slash-submarine was destroyed back in Jaya, and only few parts of it remained. Law deep down knew that fixing it wasn't possible, but he also went there to see if building a new ship with the same blueprints were possible or not. Funnily enough, Luffy was the one to suggest that. Even though Law tried to hide it, he wasn't taking it well. With so much grief Law wasn't fully thinking things straight, so he was grateful to Luffy for the suggestion. Other than back in North Blue, back in his home island only Water 7 might have the capabilities to build such a machine. Submarines were very uncommon in the Sea of Grand Line. Mainly due to hard navigation and sea kings, most people used normal ships. Law entered the galley law office and quickly found Icebug discussing, almost arguing, with a pirate about the practicality of a design. While others didn't recognize the pirate, Law did. And he was cautious and curious about him. Things might get pretty interesting. Both Usopp and Jin stood outside Frankie House, it was a bit of a hassle. But they finally found the possible location of their future shipwright. Wait before we go in. Usopp said as both of them walked towards the main door, what would you rate our possible future crewmate? Rate based on what? Jin asked with a raised eyebrow. You know based on how normal he will be. Jin scoffed, the only one normal in our crew is Sparky. And that's a talking monkey with six arms. He said, you can't expect ordinary in our crew. But, we have Anchor and Cricket in the crew. They are pretty normal. Yet, yeah, both dissidents of legends, Jin shook his head, even you are the child of a living legend. Well, uh. Usopp didn't know what to say, so he just rubbed the back of his head, yeah, my old man's pretty cool. But I'm gonna be much cooler. By this point, both pirates were in front of the large doors of the entrance. Jin shrugged, before kicking the door open, is Frankie here? Usopp winched as the large double door flung open, revealing the inside of the room. Inside was nothing but darkness as Jin's voice echoed around the room. Suddenly there was music from the room as a few spotlights turned on, revealing three figures on stage. One male and two females came to the view, posing. Did you just call my name, said the blue-haired man wearing a shirt over his blue underwear, and an unbuttoned shirt, don't be shy. Call my name. Frankie. I'm the island's most superman. Frankie. And he ended with a pose, leaning on his left as his huge forearms met each other to make a blue start. The two young women Frankie family's square sisters by his side also followed that pose, mirroring the man. The other thugs of the Frankie family cheered and tossed flower petals around for effect. Both Usopp and Jin didn't say anything for a while, before Jin broke the silence. Oh, great, so he's a stripper. He commented dryly. Oi. Who are you calling a stripper? Chapter 387 The group of straw hats at the sea train station had to wait a bit for their ride to arrive. While the sea train was fast, it would take some time to get here. In the meantime Sparky and Kobe were able to befriend Chimney and her cat which was actually a rabbit gone bay. Kokoro was still cautious of the group, but she seemed a bit more eased now. Mainly after Sanji brought in some snacks for the group. Soon the sea train arrived and unlike the other sea train, this one was completely white in design, with the marine and world government symbol on it. The train also had only three compartments in it, and because of this it was also very fast, unlike the other trains. It was also operated fully by marines and when they saw the straw hats they seemed to be a bit on guard. Even though the Straw Hats had a good reputation they were also pirates so the marines by nature were cautious of them. Still, not all of them had glares, some were genuinely curious about the group. Many of the marines did respect Luffy for what he did back in G3 base in Alabasta, and with his relation with Garp, he was quite famous. The door of the sea trained opened and the Straw Hats hopped on board. 
but they were surprised by what they saw. Ho, oh, now isn't this just a grand welcome, Luffy said while crossing his arms. Even though he was calm on the outside, on the inside he was a bit worried. Why did the Navy HQ send an admiral to receive me? Hum. Kizaru looked up from his fashion magazine, yawning as he looked at Luffy and his group, before returning back to reading his magazine. Luffy's brow twitched, Oi, at least answer me. Kizaru sighed, I'm just doing my job, he said as he shrugged, returning back to reading his fashion magazine. He's a slow one, isn't he, Sparky said from Luffy's shoulder. Kizaru blinked slowly, before looking at Sparky, and tilting his head a talking monkey, he pointed at before slowly moving his finger to Luffy, on top of another monkey? How does that work? You are called the yellow monkey? How does that work? Uh, so many monkeys. Kizaru nodded before slowly returning back to reading his magazine. Luffy looked back to his crewmates and shrugged it seemed they were stuck with him. The marines nearby escorted his group to seats in the same compartment. It was big enough for all of them, but they were a bit on guard with having an admiral on board. Kabi's first impression of meeting an admiral was, slow. So you want me to check out your ship, eh? Frankie asked, that's super awesome. He said doing the pose before sitting down and leaning in to make eye contact with the pirates, but it will cost a pretty penny. Now Frankie, Usopp and Jin were sitting in his makeshift office. Usopp and Jin were also there in their disguises. Sporting the name Soaking and Jintaro with pride. Like them the Square Sisters were also with them, standing behind Frankie while they crossed their arms coolly. How expensive are we talking here? Jin asked, but Usopp stopped him. Jintaro. 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 Money isn't an issue when it comes to our ship, Usopp said, making a fist of passion, our love for the ship knows no bounds. So money, don't worry about money but we would like you to work on our ship, so that the Going Merry can sail without any issue. Of course, unlike them, the Going Merry wasn't that famous so she didn't need a name change, only the appearance change would do. Jin looked at Usopp as if he was mad. He really wanted to point out that Nami might literally kill him if he spent money unwisely. But then he heard something as he moved his head to the side. Frankie was shedding emotional manly tears hearing Usopp's declaration, along with the Square Sisters. Hey, maybe Usopp's onto something, Jin thought. Such love and camaraderie for one's ship. He said, grabbing Usopp's arms, I have to know the name of a man like yours. My name is Soaking, hailing from the land of snipers. I'm the best sniper in the world. And I'm the captain. Usopp said before gesturing to his side, and this is Jintaro, he's the best, loyal mate in the world? Yes, that. And he's my vice-captain. Jin sighed, but nodded, our crew is relatively new. So you might have not heard it. Usopp carried on with passion, but don't worry, one day our names will be on the front page of newspapers, with people cheering on our behalf. Frankie nodded as he crossed his arms, I often say, talk is cheap. But you guys have a superior burning manly passion in you and that makes me believe otherwise. He said with his weird and iconic pose. But I'm a bit curious, why do you want me to check out your ship? If money isn't an issue, then you could have gone to Galley Law Company. They also have amazing shipwrights there, well of course not sup here as me, but still. That might be true. But someone recommended you, and he was my close friend. I can't tell you his name, but you once worked on his ship to set up your inventions. And he really praised your work, and we also did some research. Frankie raised an eyebrow as he leaned in, but didn't interrupt. You have quite the fame back in Auction Island for your inventions and your shipwright skills. So we want you to help us out, and maybe later on, we might offer you something that you won't be able to refuse. Now, I'm hooked. Frankie grinned, leaning back on his chair. He did visit Auction Island from time to time, he even had plans to buy the recent Adam Wood from there. But I also am curious about your group, haven't heard of you or anything. Chapter 388 Even though Frankie was a bit surprised that the unknown pirates knew about his shipwright skills, when the pirates mentioned Auction Island it made some sense. You see, the main work of the Frankie family was to disassemble ships and sell those parts officially in Water 7 or the Auction Island nearby. But sometimes Frankie would get creative and build functional ship parts, such as weapons or jet engines to sell it at the Auction Island. And when someone bought them, Frankie had to set them up in their ships. While doing so, Frankie would usually go a step further and check out the whole ship, if possible, 
either fix them or recommend solutions for it. He had been doing it for a few years now. So he did have a reputation as an unusual shipwright. Actually, Luffy was the one who told Usopp all of this. When the rubber man asked Usopp to recruit Frankie, the sniper of course asked why. And Luffy had explained it, he couldn't just tell how he knew of his future crewmate. Which wasn't a lie. Luffy had been keeping an eye on Frankie by Morgan's newsbirds. The cyborg did have a reputation there. So Luffy told him that. Usopp started, like I said, our crew is relatively new. We were mainly a bounty hunting crew not too long ago. But stuff happened and some shitty marines labeled us as pirates. So yeah, rather than going into hiding we now fly a Jolly Roger. Yeah, fuck the world government and the marines. The so-called vice captain added from the side. The square sisters nodded along. They also had brought snacks and tea in the midst of the conversation, and Jin was gulping them down, after lifting the mouth portion of his night helmet. Frankie nodded, it wasn't new. Many pirate groups do come about like that, there were many corrupt marines, and sometimes when cashing in bounties they wanted a good portion of the share. If not they will sometimes wrongfully accuse you of piracy and brand you as criminals. While Frankie might not like working with pirates, it was better working with marines or any world government agents. And besides it was a shipwright's duty to help ships in need. Well, can't argue there. Frankie said, before rubbing his chin, anyway, it's a bit late, do you want me to check out your ship now, or first thing in the morning? Now, Usopp replied, not hesitating, if it's okay with you. Frankie stood up, sure, this will be super awesome. He grinned, let's check out your ship first, he said, standing up, and tell you what. I already like you guys. If it comes down to it, and in future, you guys do need a ship, I will give you guys a discount. Usopp just smiled underneath his mask. After that, all of them left for the going merry. Frankie checked out the whole ship, and he was really impressed. The ship was from the East Blue, just by looking at the craftsmanship and design, he could tell it was from there. But what made Frankie truly impressed was the fact that a ship from that far managed to come here without taking any significant damage. Of course, the ship had been reworked multiple times, to add layers of protection. But he was sure the crewmates of the ship really took care of it. While Frankie was looking over the going merry, the rest of the straw hats returned from their trips. Well most of them, Law had yet to return. But that wasn't the main concern. Other than the group, there were also a few unwanted people who were keeping an eye on them. After the initial checking was done, the ship sailed in near Frankie House where Frankie could get fully into work. But what Frankie and the Straw Hats failed to notice some figures that were observing them. A few hours had passed and the CP9 was back at the island, and they had their target in sight. They just had to set things up. Of course, with the Straw Hats wearing disguises they didn't recognize any of them. But it didn't matter. Their main target was Frankie after all. Got to say, you guys really take good care of your ship. Frankie said, impressed, the ship needs some repair, but I have to ask, why did you guys put a dinosaur skull in front of the ship? You part of the new pirate group that's in Galila. Usopp was confused under his mask, but like always, he decided to lie, eh, it's complicated. He said, before trying to change the subject. Not knowing how he threw off their unwanted observers, so how long will the repairs take? We would also like you to add some of your personal modifications for the ship. Frankie grinned, Hat, you sure? I get pretty crazy when it comes to modifications. He said, they are super. So you won't have to worry. But before that let's talk about payment. Nami snapped her head at Frankie when she heard that. Her money senses were tingling. She then snapped her head towards Usopp and Jin, who felt a shiver down their spine when they noticed her. They gulped. But of course, Frankie didn't notice it. 20,000 for the checking and 30,000 for repairs, oh, and the modifications will cost extra. So are you guys paying up front? That's just ripping us off. Nami roared coming to the side. Frankie was a bit surprised when the girl appeared from nowhere, but he wasn't backing down. I mean of course it's expensive. But unlike others, I'm only charging you four times the amount as Galley Law Company. But you did say, money wasn't a problem. Now this is just getting back on your words as a man. What Frankie didn't mention was that, unlike Galley Law he was going to do all the work alone. And even though the ship was small, it would still take four men to do it. So he was taking four times the payment. 
even though he was ripping his customers off, in his mind it was justified. They did seem loaded, after all, also this would give him enough money to buy that Adam would. No no. Usopp quickly said, stopping Nami. Internally wincing at the earful he was going to receive later, my crewmate, Mani, is a bit shy when spending money, but don't worry about it. But still, we would like a discount. Nami's brows twitched, hearing this, but she calmed down her nerves. Sure they had a shit ton of money, but she wouldn't let Usopp waste them like this. She looked at her side spotting Anchor and Cricket. Chapter 389 Frankie rubbed his chin, I can only give you guys a 10% discount, but I want my money up front. No. This time it was surprisingly Anchor who stopped Frankie, most shipwrights take their payment after working. And you are asking for four times more, so, why do we have to pay beforehand? Cricket also chimed in, yeah, how would we even know if your work is good or not? You might as well try to run away with our money. Nami nodded vigorously at his side. Usopp facepalmed himself. What? Listen here, bub. No one questions my skills, Frankie said, and what would you even know about shipwright, old man? Popeye's brow twitched, the disguise he was wearing made him look old, but he didn't appreciate it, I am not a shipwright, but I did work on our ship along with USO. I mean our captain. Also, I'm a smith, and as a smith. I take pride in building my stuff for passion, more than just building stuff for money. Cricket also crossed his arms and nodded, I know a bit about modifying ships myself, and what you are asking is just too much. Nami at her side also nodded along. That's not manly at all. Yeah, a true man would work for passion, Jin added, making Usopp look at him questionably. They were trying to recruit him here not gaslight him. What he said. Popeye nodded, are you really a man if you do it for money? What? I'm super manly. Frankie defended, looking at Popeye, and Cricket, but I think you have a problem with me. Wanna settle this man to man? I ain't afraid of no one. Especially not you, old man. Popeye didn't back down, taking his pipe down from his mouth, bring it. Guys, guys we don't have to do this. Usopp tried defusing the situation. But Jin stopped him, he had a knowing grin behind his helmet. But Frankie ignored him, fine if you win, I will charge the normal amount. Anchor raised an eyebrow, and you want nothing in return. Insulting you would be enough, old man. Anchor's brow twitched, I'm gonna enjoy this. He said, cracking his knuckles, while Frankie did the same. Wait. Usopp said, stopping right in the middle, no fighting. You guys will rip each other apart. But if you are going to settle this like men, then do it the right way. Both Anchor and Frankie looked at him. Arm wrestling, Usopp suggested, flexing his arms, which had only a bit of muscle. While Usopp did get strong, his muscles weren't that visible. He was what some would call a hard gainer. The only way to settle things between real men. Fine, Frankie said, let's see if you can beat me in arm wrestling, old man. I'll crush you with my arms. No one has ever beat me in arm wrestling. He finished showing off his oversized forearms. Popeye looked at Frankie and shook his head, also flexing his own oversized forearms, sure thing. Just don't whine after you lose. Frankie snorted, if I lose, I might as well join the stupid crew. And that ain't happening. Yeah, big bro Frankie. You can do it, the square sisters said from the side. They were absent for a while but seemed they had listened in for most of the argument. The members of the Frankie family also cheered along. A bench was set up, and both men stood by their side as the arm wrestling match began. And it was easy to say that Frankie didn't even stand a chance. Not by a long shot, even with his cybernetic enhancements he lost to Popeye in the arm wrestling match. Frankie was on the floor looking at his arms, I... I lost. Popeye smirked, wondering why Frankie's arm felt weird, but he didn't question it. Frankie snapped his head at him, best out of three. Anchor smirked, sure. And Frankie lost again. I I refuse to believe this. Ha, it's not about that anymore, Nami said, walking up to him, now you will charge us the normal price. Deal. Frankie grumbled, fine. Keiku, Bluno and Califal looked at the scene between the pirate group and Frankie, wondering if their info on Frankie having the blueprint was true or not. But it didn't matter. Things were almost set up, and the show was about to start.
By the time the sea train reached Navy HQ, an odd scene was playing out inside the sea train. Hey, old man, pass me the salt, Luffy said, blowing his food, while eating the hot noodles. Hey, new pirates these days, no manners, Kizaru said as he passed the salt while chowing down on the Yudin noodles. Ho who knew you could make cup noodles so good, Sanji Kun? I did. That's why I made him my chef, Luffy butted in, by the way, you should try the chicken toppings, they taste quite good with the broth. Sanji just shook his head as he cooked with limited ingredients. Still, it was better than eating cup noodles. Oh, thank you, Kizaru said, while taking some of the suggested toppings. Oi why is she getting more meat than me? Zoro complained. I don't know what you are saying, Moss Head. Sparky, stop stealing my food, dang it. I don't know what you are saying Kobe. The other marines in the sea train looked weirdly at the scene, an admiral eating noodles with a pirate crew. But then again, they were a bit jealous that only the admiral was getting food, not them. Before long the sea train reached its final destination and it was already morning by then. And the straw hats were at Marine Ford, the Marine HQ. Chapter 390 Marine Ford, Navy HQ As the sea train approached Marine Ford in the pre-dawn hours, the first light of morning painted the sky with soft hues of orange and pink. The air was thick with tension, a palpable sense of anticipation hanging over the waiting marine soldiers who had gathered on the shores. Their faces betrayed a mixture of excitement and trepidation, for the impending arrival of the warlords meant that something of great significance was about to unfold. And they knew what it was. A war. And this was just the preparations for it. The marines had meticulously prepared for this warlord meeting, their forces stationed in strategic positions around the Marine Ford headquarters. As the sea train came to a halt and the first warlord's arrival grew imminent, the soldiers tightened their grips on their weapons, their eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of the approaching vessel. The moment was charged with both uncertainty, for the warlords weren't just your average pirates. They were one faction of the world government that helped the marines maintain balance within the world. The marine soldiers that were at least in the rank of rear admirals stood in lines leaving a large wide pathway for the warlord crew to come. The atmosphere crackled with unease as the sea train finally docked, and the first warlord disembarked. All eyes were fixed upon the door of the sea train as it opened and a large man, almost ten feet in height, slightly taller than Admiral Kizaru came out. It was the fallen hero Luffy. The young man sported an all-black suit with red shirt, a loose tie that flung with the wind. His iconic straw hat was on his head along with a confident grin. A long black coat hung loosely over his shoulder as he walked in front. As he stepped out of the sea train, all of the marines near the vicinity could feel an aura of royalty and power within him. He walked forward resting his large naginata over his shoulder. Luffy wanted to make a strong impression here, and what better way than dwarfing most of the people with height and stature. Add a dash of controlled hacky into the mix and you got yourself one amazing entrance. Behind him came out Zoro and Sanji sporting almost a flame-like aura around them. Unlike their captain, they were around normal height around six feet tall, each having an intimidating aura of their own. Zoro wore a long, open dark red coat closed on his waist that's held by a red sash, into which his three swords are tucked. His black bandana is tied around his left forearm. His coat exposes his bare chest, revealing his green haramaki underneath the coat. He also, like his captain, sported a long red coat that hung loosely over his shoulder. Sanji, fashionable as ever, sported an elegant red suit, black shirt, and red tie. With black gloves around his hands. He also had a fur-trimmed coat with a black necklace. Kuina came next wearing white kimono with gold embroidery of flower petals and a sky-blue coat similar to the men in the group. She, unlike the others, sported a cold aura that enchanted her cold beauty. Right after that came Kobe in his own white full white suit, with a white coat that almost made him look like a marine captain. But unlike the marines who had the kanji of justice his was hope. Right after that, came Admiral Kuzan, who was wearing his usual yellow suit with justice coat. But on his shoulder was a four-foot monkey, wearing a loose vacation shirt. The monkey also had six arms and sported a borsalino hat. All the marines were too shocked by that odd sight, but unlike the others, Sparky didn't have a bounty or recognition so, he was kind of the underdog of the straw hats. A six-armed monkey on top of the yellow monkey of the marines, an odd sight indeed. The stage was set for a high-stakes meeting that would shape the course of events in the world and the marines of Marine Ford stood ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Right then they heard a shout, Luffy. 
it was Vice Admiral Garp whose fist was now black along with red streaks of lightning coming out of them. Fist of love. Grandpa. Luffy grinned cocking back his head, as the forehead portion of his head got covered in the blackness of armament, before both of them clashed. Head of might. Fist meeting head, creating a shockwave that sent wind around everywhere. Red sparks of lightning came out as marine soldiers dropped to the floor with foams coming out of their mouths. The aura of kings squashing down on the weaker wills present to view the sight. The straw hats behind Luffy stood their ground covering their eyes, while the ground beneath Luffy turned into rubble, spider cracks forming all around. Shishishishi. Bahahahaha. Oh so scary, Kizaru said, seeing the clash, his face having a nonchalant expression. Grandpa is scary indeed, Sparky nodded from his shoulder. Why are you on my shoulder again? Cause you lost to me in a card game and, also, because you appropriate me guiding you on the right path. Sparky said cheekily. The things I do for duty. Kobe deadpanned hearing both of them. It was almost poetic in the sense that Kizaru's worst enemy was sitting on his shoulder. Sparky's fruit was Kizaru's perfect counter after all. On the opposite side the few vice admirals present were a bit shocked at seeing the two monkey DS clashing. But then again few weren't. Suru sighed, rubbing her head, they are going to destroy the dock. Pray that they only destroy that before the war, Bogard said from her side. Hey, nice one, Vice Admiral Cancer said, I should have brought some popcorn for this shit. You guys are taking this way too casually, Momonga said while shaking his head. Even though both Mononga and Cancer were nonchalant about the situation, they were eyeing the blade users of the straw hats carefully, eyeing Zoro and Kuina who were also looking at them. I have to agree with Big Sister Tsuru. They are going to destroy the dock. Vice Admiral Jun who was standing at Tsuru's side said, before suddenly a pin rose was presented in front of her. A pink rose for the famous pink rabbit of the marines, Sanji said coolly. Almost making all of the marines snap their heads at him. When did he get here? They didn't even see him move. Oi, oi, you oughta get in line, blonde, toki cake or better known as Shatan said coming in front of the female vice admiral trying to assert his dominance, I done asked that gorgeous woman out more an a hundred times now. Ain't no way I'ma let some greenhorn young un mosey on in here and mess up my cordon. You wanna take it outside, uncle. Sanji said as he didn't back down. Uncle? I'm in my thirties, ya dern snot-nosed little varmint. Eh? Really? Must have been the receding hairline, I'm sorry, Sanji said, not actually meaning it. Why you? Chapter 391 Water 7 Right before the crack of dawn, the Straw Hats could be seen celebrating with the Frankie family. All of them were a lively bunch that enjoyed partying and with the going merry going back into its pristine condition, the crew could relax a bit. Of course, Frankie did warn the crew that the going merry wasn't meant for the Grand Line, and that it would get damaged from usage. He also suggested buying or making a new ship meant for the Grand Line. One that wouldn't strain the ship. Everyone was now in the Frankie house, the giant warehouse that housed all the members of Frankie's group. Having a mixture of ship-related things and the cavernous interior was divided into sections, each meticulously organized with an array of shipwright tools, materials, and equipment. Stacks of lumber, coiled ropes, barrels of tar, and bins of nails lined the massive shelves that were scattered around the area. The place was big, enough to fit a few ships inside, and situated near the open sea so ships could be easily disassembled for their parts. After Frankie checked the going merry, the group of bounty hunters and pirates decided to throw a small party to celebrate. And Hatchin was the main man of the show, with his six armed cooking skills that he had improved over the months, he was gaining a lot of attention from the food freaks of the Frankie family. They valued him as a cook and the six armed fishermen really appreciated it. Yusaku, Anchor and Cricket were also there, doing their own thing mainly keeping themselves busy with either stupid challenges or stuffing their face. However, Anchor did get multiple challenges by the Frankie family for arm wrestling matches. Which he won every time. Other than that, they were more or less relaxing. Still, the pirates were already missing Sky Island. The environment and the atmosphere were just better up there. That was more suitable for relaxing. Water 7 on the other hand was more or less an urban city, so things were a bit different. Isa and Grote were also enjoying the party, they could be seen running around going from one place to another before going back on the going merry playing on the ship. Nami was doing her own thing. As she was super busy with all the weather-related tech the Frankie family had. Most of them were junk or scavenged from old ships, 
but some of them were quite interesting to her. Especially a log pose that had three needles, a log pose that was meant for the second half of the Grand Line. For the Frankie family, they were mostly junk, but for Nami she was very interested in those junk. Jin on his end went out looking for laws he hadn't returned yet. Luffy warned Jin, Usopp and Nami about possible CP9 members being here, so they weren't using transponder snails as their conversations might get eavesdropped on. Usopp on his end was quite happy that they managed to fully get the ship fixed by a professional shipwright. Said shipwright was trying to make him drink and reveal his secrets to wealth. It was funny in a way, cause the only one who was getting drunk was Frankie. Usopp wasn't a drinker and when you join a crew whose captain is fully a health freak, you tend to avoid it. And besides Usopp had to keep his guard up, all the time. Water 7 was relatively dangerous with what Luffy had said so the last thing he wanted was to get drunk and in trouble. So even though Usopp was on his 14th bottle he wouldn't be getting drunk anytime soon. The sniper had many tricks up his sleeve and one way to not get drunk was not to drink. And he was doing just that, his powers were really useful in fooling people. In some ways, he made the right choice when choosing this fruit. The same couldn't be said for Frankie, as the cyborg was pissed drunk. The cyborg wasn't used to drinking, so rather than Usopp revealing his secrets to Frankie, the shipwright was confessing to the sniper instead. You know when I was wee bit younger, I used to make ships for someone big, ha, I even worked with that icebag idiot. Our teacher was the greatest shipwright of all times, and my inventions were a lot cooler than that ice idiot. Frankie mumbled under the loud music of the party. Other than Usopp no one would usually be able to pick up on his words, and then again, who would listen to a drunk man's rumblings. Frankie wasn't usually like this with other people. He usually kept most of his past to himself, but Frankie found some camaraderie in Sogging. A man who wanted to be a brave warrior of the sea, and a man who also had a passion for building things. So Frankie had a gut feeling that trusting him would be good, that's why he was a bit eased in telling him about stuff. Mainly since Usopp had brought up one day building a ship like Oro Jackson. Things happened, and I had an accident. Frankie said, like a drunk man who's reliving his sour memories, I had to turn myself into a cyborg to survive, can you believe it, So King? A cyborg that runs on cola, isn't that super cool? Cyborg? That's so cool. Usopp nodded solemnly, but do you know what's even cooler? Cyborgs with capes. Cyborgs with capes? Soaking you are weird. But I do have to admit, a cape would be cool. No, Sapir. Wait. Is that why you are so tough? Ha, why else would I be? Frankie said before winching, Oi, don't poke a needle in my ass. I turned myself into a cyborg, so I was only able to do the front part. My back parts are still human. Hey, still cool. Usopp said, while Frankie rambled along, about his past. And Usopp just listened. If he was going to be a future crewmate, this might be screening of some sort. It might be naive to think, but Frankie was a good guy at heart. He, just like others in the crew, had a bad past. He had a big dream, and Usopp could see why Luffy wanted him on the crew. So, that's why I plan to make a ship that will sail to the ends of the world. Grand Line and beyond. Frankie rambled completely drunk, and you know what? So King San I got the perfect material for the ship. A whole trunk of atom wood that's sitting right now in the auction island, the best wood in the world for the world's best ship. You serious? Usopp asked, leaning in, that's awesome. I heard that Oro Jackson was made with the same wood. Is it true? Of course it is. Frankie grinned, before whispering, don't tell anyone I said this, but I heard the ship was built here, in Water 7. But don't tell anyone that. Usopp nodded. About the atom wood, isn't that usually a lot expensive? Frankie sadly nodded sloping down on the counter, crying comically, yeah, it's 200 million berries. I don't think I will be able to buy it. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, all right, even we don't have that much, Usopp lied, scratching his chin thoughtfully, but I might know a guy who might be able to buy it, he's even looking to make a ship. A big one, hmm. Frankie grabbed Usopp slash Soaking, what really? He needs a ship right, right? I can make a ship? Who is he anyway? Please say he isn't a marine. Usopp pushed Frankie off while holding his head, well he isn't a marine per se, but. Usopp was about to persuade him to join his crew. Or at least the straw hats, but then something happened. 
he started feeling dizzy, eh, what's that smell? Frankie also frowned at the smell, as he started getting dizzy, I smell women. Usopp had a lot to say about that last statement, but he plopped to the counter table, along with Frankie. Immediately falling asleep. And it wasn't just them, everyone in the Frankie family house who were partying dropped to the floor one by one, almost falling into deep slumber. What is happening? Anchor was the last one to say, before falling asleep like Cricket and Yusaku. Even Nami was on the floor snoring like the rest. The same case was for Isa. I am Grote. Only Grote was awake, and the young one was panicking, trying to shake Isa awake. They were just playing on the going merry when suddenly everyone started falling asleep in the Frankie house. Something was wrong, and Grote couldn't tell what. Suddenly the warehouse door was kicked open, revealing the silhouette of four figures. All of them dressed in black suits as they walked in. Chapter 392 Your powers are really amazing, you know that? They have gotten a lot stronger than last time. One of them said, it was none other than Jabra. The Cypher Paul agent was in his human form and wearing a mask that covered his face and nose. Khalifa just fixed her glasses and puffed up her chest a bit, it would have gotten even better if I was constantly using it, but I had to hold back due to the mission, eh, but it's good to know that I still got it. She chuckled. Along with her was also Bluno and Keiku. And one thing to mention was, other than Khalifa, all of them were wearing special air filter masks on their face. It was to protect them from Khalifa's powers. Anyway, let's wrap this up, guys. The sun is rising, Luchi should have everything set up, so it's the best time to take our target, Keiku said before spotting Frankie on the table along with Sogking. Also, any ideas of who the pirate group is? No, clue. Most probably some new rookies, anyways, should we kill them here? Jabra asked, giving almost a bloodthirsty grin, I mean, I can make the kills quick. Keiku rolled his eyes. Jabra had been a bit bloodthirsty lately, maybe it had something to do with the failed mission where they confronted the revolutionary. Something to do with a new drug or something, Keiku didn't know. And he didn't care either. We have to make it fast, killing or making too much noise might bring attention to us. Keiku was cut midway, when it happened. I am Groat. All of the Cypher Paul agents scattered as multiple wooden spikes were thrown their way from a tree creature that was rapidly growing in size. The creature jumped off the ship, as it roared attacking with his vines and wooden tendrils. Who the fuck is that? Jabra questioned as he jumped back from one of the wooden tendrils that attacked him. More importantly, why isn't it affected by my powers? Khalifa asked, no one can escape my sleep sleep fruit. My sleep gas should have knocked it out. Don't waste any time, we have to take care of this before any attention is brought to us. Bluno said, before opening a door midair and getting in just in time to dodge some wooden spikes thrown at his previous location. Everyone go now. We have to take it down. Keiku ordered, as all the Cypher Paul agents moved in unison against the young Grote. The four CP9 agents needed to take care of things fast, the sun had already risen, which meant their mission time had begun. While Keiku was leading the team to raid the Frankie house and capture Frankie. Luchi on his end was doing his own job. The whole mission was orchestrated by Luchi, who was much better at planning than Shpondam. When the sun rose in Water 7, Luchi took it upon himself to create a distraction so that most of the people in Water 7 were busy. And also to stop Icebig in case he wanted to stop the CP9. Right now, the island of Water 7 was in massive panic. Their mayor Icebig was attacked just before dawn by the group of infamous pirates. The kid pirates had some disagreements with Icebig and according to an injured Luchi, the kid pirates tried to kill Icebug. The same kid pirates that were on the island, to modify their own ship. So, now almost every able sailor of the Water 7 was out there attacking the kid pirates and their ships. And Kid and Killer were having a hard time escaping from the place. Of course, the kid pirates did no such thing. It was mainly Luchi's own group, him, Fukuro and Kumidori, that attacked Icebig and confirmed if he had the Pluton blueprints or not. Kid pirates were already causing a bit of trouble with the locals of Water 7. And Luchi also needed to put the blame for Shpondam's death and Icebig's attack on someone, so they were chosen as the main targets. Now all the blame fell upon them, as they tried to leave the island. After some forceful interrogation on Icebug, they were able to find that Luchi's main theory was correct. Only Frankie knew the locations of the blueprints. The other CP9 team was already at Frankie's house arresting the criminal for keeping such key information to himself. 
Also Luchi this time made it so that it looked like the kid pirates killed off Keiku and him so even Icebug didn't know who the traitors were. Back at Frankie house. I, am Grote. The young Grote said, before falling to the floor, with multiple injuries on his body. Finally, the bastard is way tougher than he looks, Jabra grunted in his half-wolf Zoan form, wiping the blood off his face. Like him, Califla, Bluno, and even Keiku had a few injuries on their body. Who would have guessed that a tree creature would be that fearsome? Bluno grabbed the young Grote by the arm, making sure he was knocked out or not. Only after putting him in sea stone cuffs did all of them relax a bit. What a weird Zoan fruit user, even after putting him in sea cuffs he was still in that hideous form, Jabra said. I don't think that's a Zoan, Califa said, maybe a wood or tree paramecia. What should we do with him? Let's bring him back to the base, Bluno said, he's still young, with proper teachings he could be a good cipher Paul agent in the future. Jabra grunted, don't act all smug. I know you are going to try and give him to your new master, he said with a grin as he returned back to his normal form, I ain't against that, but if you are going to do a favor include as well. And if that's the case, then let's take the other kid as well. I'm pretty sure those white wings on her back were real. Of course, all of them knew what Jabra meant, they had been keeping an eye on the group for a few hours now. So they did see Isa, and with her having wings, it was no secret that she was from one of the Sky Islands. Only Sky Island people had white wings, which were quite precious to the world nobles. But they were more or less meant to be slaves rather than trained, especially since it was female. We have a mission here, Keiku said, stopping both Bluno and Jabra, as he picked up Frankie over his shoulder, also let's not waste any time here. If it was Rob Lucci then Jabra would have listened, but Lucci wasn't around so he wouldn't take orders from Keiku. Chapter 393 Yeah, yeah you say that but it will only take a minute, Jabra said, jumping up to get a vantage point, but he didn't see where Isa was. Khalifa felt disgusted but didn't outwardly protest her opinions. If the girl was found, then she would be sold as a slave, well as a woman she really didn't like that. Especially with how things were done by the celestial dragons. What they didn't know was that Grote hid Isa inside the going Mary when he saw the four figures break in. Saving the girl from getting caught. Bluno on his end just shrugged as he focused on his powers. He had gotten a lot better. Unlike the others, he had to actively use his powers a lot, more so since he started working under Saint Camail. So now he could maintain two doors on different positions, even if they were separated by hundreds of kilometers. Making it an easy way of transportation. Finally after concentrating for a while a special door manifested in front of him. Everyone, come here. I can only keep the door open for a few seconds after I open it he said as he grabbed the handle of the door, while Keiku came with Frankie's body over his shoulder. Khalifa also came over, holding the cuffed young Grote along. Keiku was already there with Frankie. So the only one remaining was Jabra who was still looking for the winged girl. Oi, Jabra come back, we have to leave, Keiku said, getting a bit pissed. Jabra quickly came down, and snorted, Oi, Khalifa stop your powers, I need to use my nose to find the scent of the girl. He said. Colorful sleep sleep fruit released an almost invisible gas that put anyone to sleep if they inhaled it. It didn't distinguish between foes or allies. That's the reason why other than Califa all of the CP agents were wearing special air masks. Califla frowned, make it fast, I don't really agree with what is happening, but, just make it fast. Even though she didn't really like what Jabra was doing, she didn't protest it. Mainly if it got them in a few favors with a world noble. For her and almost all of the agents nothing the world nobles did was wrong, and their words were law, so even though she inherently hated it, her programming said otherwise. Sure, sure, Jabra rolled his eyes, while Khalifa dropped her powers. The air around them shifted as if something was getting sucked into Khalifa's body. And after a few seconds, the sleeping gas was gone. Jabra grinned as he took off his special air filter mask, transforming into his hybrid wolf Zoan form. Sniffing the air trying to find the scent, but rather than that, he smelled a beast instead. Right then, a voice came from the corridor, what are you doing with Groat? Right then, a voice came from the corridor, what are you doing with Groat? Keiku was the first one to see who it was, and his eyes widened. Right then a grey blur came between them, punching Keiku right in his face, breaking his square long nose, along with flinging his body to the other end of the warehouse, going through any machines and furniture that were in his way and making him fall into the sea. 
Frankie's body was thrown up in the air, as Keiku was sent flying. What the? Jabber moved, but gasped midway as the grey blur hit his throat, almost destroying his vocal cord, something hit him by the side sending him flying against a pillar, and making him fly out of the warehouse. Next was Bluno who managed to use Tekai, Iron Body, to make himself tougher before the grey blur punched him in the jaw, breaking several of his teeth and pinning him against the ceiling like a nail. The last one was Califla, who jumped back releasing massive leaps of sleeping gas. The figure was revealed, and it was none other than Jin, or Jintaro since he was still in his disguise. Only uses partial transformation on his hands and feet. Jin went after her immediately, like an animal, on all fours, but rather than going towards her, he lost his balance and crashed into a wall. Gur, what the? He stopped himself when he figured out that her powers worked through some sort of gas. He clicked his tongue, regretting the fact that he couldn't figure it out sooner. Jin had already taken a good dosage of the sleeping gas. Even with life return he wasn't able to keep himself awake. So Jin held his breath and through sheer willpower, he moved on. Man in black suits, using the Rokushiki. Definitely the cipher Paul, Jin had to do something or his crewmates, and his future crewmate, might be in danger. Jin moved forward like an wild bull, while Khalifa brought her hands forward, sleep bomb. An invisible air blast hit Jin making him stop for a bit before he pushed forward. Colifal smiled as her powers took effect, sure one could hold their breath to avoid her sleep gas, but there were other ways her sleep gas took effect. Like for example, seeping in through someone's ears, or even skin. Her sleep bomb was a technique where she was able to control the small gas bomb to latch onto the target until they were fully knocked out. With Jin slowing down, Colifal took out her whip and attacked him with it trying to make him bleed so that her powers could fully affect. But that was a mistake as Jin at the last moment was able to grab the whip and pull her near him, intending to finish her with a punch. Jin missed her by a wide margin as she dodged it midair using Jeppo, while the Zoan user was staggering. Jin still dizzy wanted to attack her, when suddenly Jabra in his full Zoan from drop kicked him from the side, making him fall to his knees. Jabra backed off immediately when Jin attacked again. The Cypher Paul agent only growled, before coughing his throat still having a notable dent in it. Even with his Zoan recovery, it would take a while before that injury is fixed. Chapter 394 Tempest Kick Gah! Jin fell forward with a large slash mark on his back as he fell forward. The sleeping gas finally fully took effect as Jin started to feel its effects. It was Keiku who had gotten up and attacked from behind. His Pinocchio square nose was fully squashed on itself and was constantly bleeding. It would have been even worse, but at the last moment, he managed to kick his head back when the punch landed, saving him from getting knocked out. He was also fully soaked due to him falling into his sea, good thing he wasn't a devil fruit user. Jin wanted to get up, but something dropped like a meteor on top of his head almost pinning him to the ground, making him gasp for air. It was Bluno, who also came down to attack, his condition looked worse as almost all of his teeth were broken by Jin's previous punch. Kill that motherfucker. Jabra growled before coughing. He shrieked when he noticed unlike them he wasn't wearing the special air filter mask. Those masks were a lot durable as Keiku's even survived a punch from Jin. But without them, Jabra was getting the full effect of the sleeping gas. Only his immunity to toxins and enhanced Zoan physique saved him from quickly getting knocked out immediately. But as if hearing his words Jin growled, and suddenly a tail with a mace ended tail grew out of his back and attacked Bluno who was standing on top of Jin. Bluno managed to use iron body in time but that was ineffective against Jin's attack. The mace end of Jin's tail had spikes on it and it hit right on Bluno's left arm, breaking it as his body bent around the attack. Throwing him off and onto Jabra, who was looking for the air filter mask. Making both of them go through a pillar and a wall. Jin in a last ditch effort to save his crewmates, tried to get into his full Zoan form. He grew in size, his body bucking up in a lizardfish dinosaur-like manner. Kali Fala was wide-eyed as she stretched out her hands attacking with multiple sleep gas bombs. And Keiku on his end threw multiple tempest kicks on his body, severely damaging his back. Jin with every bit of his willpower came forward, before his transformation started to fully minimize as he grew human. Finally, Kalifal's powers fully took effect as he started to calm down as he walked towards Khalifa. Jin staggered, stumbling, falling right into Khalifa's arms as she pressed Jin in between her bosoms, there, there sleep big boy. She said while she pressed his head into her chest, releasing sleeping gas to drown a whole elephant. Boobs. Jin mumbled as his head was pressed down on her chest, 
before suddenly his turn sharp momentarily, throat. With that, Jin opened his jaw, in an inhumanly large manner, sharp canine teeth almost digging right into Caliphas' throat, almost ripping her throat off, and almost killing her. But before Jin's jaw could close on his throat, Keiku came in with a kick that knocked Jin off of her onto the side, throwing him off as he skipped like a rock a few times before falling into the nearby water. That was stupid, you could have died. Keiku almost yelled but stopped when he saw how shaken up Caliphla was. Caliphla was too stunted to even speak, shaken by the near-death experience. Keiku only growled before looking at Jabra, it was all his fault. But that bastard was already asleep, knocked out due to Caliphas' powers due to not wearing that mask. Keiku clicked his tongue, what is up with this whole crew, first a tree Zoan and then the monster Zoan, he was even using some kind of move similar to Soru, why can't things be easy? He said before grabbing his broken nose, winching at the pain before putting his nose back his place with gritted teeth. Let's get this over with. Agreed. We have to get back. Bliuno said, while holding Jabra on his shoulder. His other arm loosely by his side, I also need to fix my arm. Keiku nodded, grabbing Frankie and making sure he was still alive or not. He then looked back at his opponent, a devil fruit user who fell to the sea, there was no coming back from there. We leave now. We wasted a lot of time already. Keiku said, and with that the CP9 agents left, taking Frankie and Grote with them. Not knowing what storm they had set upon themselves each to it. In an ice lobby. A tragedy has taken place, the previous night world government chief Spondam was killed in Water 7 when he tried to apprehend the kid pirates. His death was mourned by marines and world government agents. Or that was officially the case, no one really liked him there, but everyone kept shut. Officially, Vice Admiral Anigamo just arrived to investigate his death and go after the Kid Pirates. But after hearing that former Admiral King Bradley might make an appearance he went after Kid Pirates immediately. Anigamo didn't like Spondam that much, but he was a fellow absolute justice seeker so he went after the Kid Pirates. Of course, the Vice Admiral also wanted to get on the good side of the former Admiral. Former Admiral Bradley was known for his swordsmanship, it was even said that in his prime he clashed with Roger Pirates multiple times. His missing right arm was the result of one such confrontation. But even then the former admiral was a commendable swordsman. If Anigamo was able to get on his good side, maybe he could help him boost his own powers. Make him stronger than that bastard Momonga. With those in mind, Vice Admiral Anigamo went after the Kid Pirates with their own ship, intending to capture the Kid Pirates and boost his reputation. Right as the Vice Admiral left the CP9 agents came back with Frankie and Grote, with their mission seemingly being over. Chapter 395 In the enveloping shadows, a voice murmured, Wake, wake up. The urgency in its tone grew, Wake up. Five more minutes. Isa mumbled, unaware of the danger that the crew was in. Wake up. The crew needs our help. As if those words made some sense, Isa barely was able to open her eyes. King Sanji did order her to protect the crew, though that was more out of fondness rather than duty. Still, the little warrior of the Shandorian tribe took her duties seriously. With much resistance, Isa was able to open her eyes, only to see nothing. Nothing but darkness. What? Where? A hazy question escaped Isa's lips as she grappled with her unfamiliar surroundings, her mind felt uneasy, almost drowsy. Seeing the darkness she was jolted awake, where am I? The air was oppressively thick, and every heartbeat felt like a desperate plea as she strained to understand her situation. Where am I? Whoa. Her mounting fear made her move and struggled, making her stumble out of a confining closet, gasping in shock as she hit the ground. Ow. She hissed as she looked around. She looked around feeling confused. It felt like just moments ago she had been playing tag with Grote aboard the Going Merry. Her present location confused her. You're still here. Whispered an ethereal presence. Her eyes darted around frantically, but all she saw was the dark room. Was her mind playing tricks on her? Her heart raced in puzzlement, cold sweat already on her forehead. The unseen voice seemed, warm. That felt strangely out of place. It was as if her instincts were telling her not to be afraid. Strange. She looked around trying to guess her current location. Despite the engulfing darkness, faint moonlight filtering through the windows provided some clarity. Why am I in the navigation room? She pondered aloud, confused taking note of the meticulously arranged maps and books that surrounded her. 
their organized display deepened the puzzlement of her sudden appearance there. As she contemplated her next move, her stomach voiced its own urgent demand. Ah! I'm hungry! She groaned. Not the best time to be hungry, but like Captain Luffy said. Food always came first. She looked around. And, there before her lay a fruit with an enchanting design. Under her observation Haki, or Mantra, the fruit seemed to pulsate with an irresistible allure, beckoning her to eat it. Without much thought, she surrendered to her hunger, and bit it. She grimaced at its bitter flavor but forced it down out of habit. The scarcity of food during Enel's reign in Skypiea had instilled in her a reluctance to waste. Yet, she couldn't shake off the peculiar taste. And at the same time, she felt an odd sense of power within her. Why does this fruit taste so, strange? She asked aloud. It's a devil fruit. Came the reply. Makes sense. The little girl shrugged, as she finished the last of the fruit. King Sanji did mention their weird taste. She then blinked, tilting her head, wait, does this mean I can't swim anymore? That's unfortunate. Her train of thought was interrupted, only now realizing that someone had spoken to her. Who said that? The voice now seemed crisper than before. It doesn't matter, it echoed, resonating from all around her, not anchored to any particular direction. The crew is in danger. Distress surged within Isa, what have you done to them? Who are you? There was a somber pause before the voice revealed, it's me, the going Mary. Outside, the Straw Hat crew along with the Frankie family lay dormant, still unconscious, and fast asleep due to Caliphate's soporific abilities. But their slumber wouldn't last. Bursting from the navigation room, Isa vaulted to the ship's railing, her voice ringing out with startling clarity, everyone, wake up. Frankie and Grode have been kidnapped. Her words resonated with such force that even the warehouse glasses quivered in response. The urgency in her voice jolted everyone into a state of chaotic alertness. The fuck? Where's big bro Frankie? Where's Groat? Groat got what? I'm dead if Sanji finds out. All of them panicked before everyone looked at the little girl. There were signs of a fight here, along with the unusual drowsiness, everyone knew something was very wrong. With a resigned sigh, Isa braced herself for the inevitable wave of questions. After all the pirates and bounty hunters stopped bombarding Isa with questions, she told them what Mary told her. Things pretty down after that bombshell. Shit. Usopp cursed, we should reach out to Jin and Law, perhaps we will need their help for this. Isa hesitated before admitting, there's something I forgot to mention. Usopp's expression hardened, please don't tell me he has been kidnapped as well. If that's the case, we'll need Luffy and the entire crew. The others in the crew looked at Isa with a bit of concern. Jin was one of the stronger ones in the crew, if he was kidnapped, then things were pretty bad. Rubbing the back of her neck sheepishly, Isa shook her head, no, but Jin's at sea. He tried to stop them but was overpowered. But. She closed her eyes trying to locate Jin's aura, he's alive, but weak. The crew members sighed, while the Frankie family looked confused. In the sea. The square sister asked, a bit pale, but he's a devil fruit user, how's he even alive? Yusako looked at them and shrugged, already taking off his shirt. He shrugged as he answered, he's just built different. With a focused gaze, Usopp tapped into his observation hacky, found him, he said, pointing in a specific direction. It was evident that the Frankie house had suffered some damage, indicating a recent skirmish. He's alive, that son of a gun, he's holding his breath. Yusaku fished Jin out. Already on it. Without hesitation, Yusaku dived in. As Yusaku worked to rescue Jin, Usopp honed in on his observation hacky, intent on locating Grote. He was more attuned to Grote's aura than Frankie's, but even after a minute of looking around there was no result. His inability to locate them was perplexing. Either the worst had happened, or they weren't on the island. Water 7 as an island was small, very small compared to Alabasta or Skypiea. Heck, even the capital city of Alabasta might be bigger than the island. But it was kind of given. The island of Water 7 used to be large, but each year, it sank a few inches into the ocean. So now only a small part remains. Usopp's gaze landed on Isa. Kneeling beside her, he said, Isa, can your observation hacky? I mean, Mantra detect Grote's whereabouts. Her skills in using observation hacky, mainly the range, are quite amazing. Closing her eyes, Isa tuned into her mantra, reaching out for any hint of Grote. 
several auras surged into her perception, but Grote remained unreachable. As despair threatened to take hold, she unwittingly amplified her powers, fleetingly connecting with Grote's aura before it vanished. Wincing from the unexpected surge, she tried to comprehend the newfound power. For a moment it felt like she heard Grote's voice along with Frankie. And they seemed far, pretty far away. Gently placing a hand on her shoulder, Usopp consoled, don't overwork yourself. But, did you manage to locate Grote? Shaking her head, Isa whispered, I, my mantra isn't working properly like back in Skypea. But I think he's likely not on the island. Just then, Yusaku arose with Jin, both of them gasping for air. While others were glad, Jin looked visibly restless. Any idea who's behind this? Usopp asked, going right from the answers. Jin's face darkened, them. It was those fucking. He stopped himself and only growled when he realized Isa was here. Recognizing the implication, Usopp sighed in frustration, TCH. Things can never be easy, can they? The Frankie family's distress was almost tangible. Who are they? Do you know who took Frankie? Before Usopp could respond, another voice interjected. I might have an idea. Usopp turned to see an unfamiliar, grievously wounded man, supported by someone else. To his surprise, several Frankie family members recognized him, Icebug. What happened to you? Ignoring their questions, Icebug looked at Usopp, making him out to be the leader. They've taken Frankie to an ice lobby. Your crew member should be there too. Please save them. What? The Frankie family questioned, aloud not even believing what they were hearing. Usopp didn't waste a moment, and nodded with determination. Nami, prep the ship. We have to get our crew back. He said with fire in his eyes, signaling at the storm that the world government had unknowingly unleashed. Chapter 396 An Ice Lobby Luchi, Hatori, Pigeon Agent, Fukuro and Kumidori entered the Tower of Justice. The headquarters of CP9, they walked in silently as Luchi pondered what to do with Frankie. Former Admiral Bradley was quite strict with his orders, he didn't even hesitate to kill Shpondam. So, failure wasn't an option. As all the agents entered the main office, the first thing they saw was Frankie along with some tree creature. At least the main target was captured, who the other guy was, Luchi didn't care. He was more concerned about the mission. Good, at least the target is in our hands. Luchi said as he walked in, stopping when he looked at his fellow CP9 agents. All of them looked roughed up. What happened to you guys? Fukuro voiced his question, Chape Pe Papa, you guys look like clowns. Shut it, zipper mouth. Jabra snapped, growling. Before he coughed, rubbing his throat, which was still not fully healed. Jabra only had a normal zoan, not an ancient one, so his recovery was much slower, still on the level of superhuman. Along with his recovering injury, he was also feeling a lot drowsy, mainly because of Khalifa's powers. Yoi! It appears that you have undergone a challenging experience, akin to the rigors of a grinding process. Kumidori added with a pose. I apologize for not being there and helping you, for that I will commit suicide. But everyone ignored his antics. But it was true. Aside from Luchi's group, the other agents were in pretty bad shape. Their black suits were roughed up, and ripped in several places, along with some injuries. From the looks of it, Keiku had a broken nose, Bluno had a broken arm, Jabra looked half drunk and half dead, while Califa looked pissed and scared at the same time. It seems that things were bad for them. Chape Pe Papa. Fukuro said, have you guys gotten weaker since before? Chaya Pa Pe Pup. It was a rhetorical question since he was the one who measured their Dora key just before the mission. It was as follows. Rob Lucci, 4000. Keiku, 2200. Jabra, 2180. Bluno, 2160. Kumidori, 810. Fukuro, 800. Califa, 630. Out of all of them, Bluno had the most improvement, but it was mainly due to all the risky missions he was going on because of a certain world noble's orders. Danger promotes growth, and it also includes him. Making him grow much stronger than his previous 820 score. The fact that even with that, they got beat up meant that the opponents they faced were tough. Now is not the time for this, Keiku said, stopping them, Jabra and Bluno need some medical help, help them. Yoi! 
I shall help them, for I am your ally. Kumadori said dramatically, skipping on one leg to their side. Checking out the wounded Jabra and Bluno. Even though Jabra was a bit pissed, he didn't decline the help. Luchi looked at Keiku, what happened there? He asked, not beating around the bush, is it something that I need to worry about? No, Keiku shook his head, we took care of it. Luchi nodded before he looked at his side where a knocked out and chained up Frankie lay, what about our target? We haven't interrogated him yet, Keiku said, but then again, I'm not the expert in interrogation like you. Luchi nodded, for the first time his emotionless broke into a savage grin, sometimes you just say the most obvious thing. Keiku just rolled his eyes. Luchi liked to act all calm and non-threatening like a cat, before pouncing on his prey like a leopard. He really was meant for his powers. Who's the other guy? Luchi asked, looking at the tree creature. Someone we picked up, had some potential to be a CP9 agent, if nothing else, we can just throw him to some world noble to be some pet. Either way, it doesn't matter, Califa said with a dismissive tone, before leaving the room, don't call me unless necessary. With others Califa might have tried to hide her emotions. But all of them practically grew up together so she didn't mind showing her true self, and the fact that she was pissed. Very pissed. Luchi looked at her retreating figure with a raised eyebrow. He then looked at Keiku, and hopelessly chuckled. Things didn't go as planned with capturing Frankie. Well at least the target is with us. Wake Frankie up. We will need to start interrogating him, he's the only one who knows the blueprint of Pluton he said with his hands in his pocket. He was about to leave the room when someone spoke up. Yoi! What's this? Kumadori said, looking at the small box in his hands. What the, that's mine. Jabra said, trying to take it back. But... Oops! Kumadori accidentally threw the box towards Fukuro, who caught it. Cha pe 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 pub. Isn't this the Zoan drug we were supposed to report to Shpondam? Fukuro asked looking at the small box which had three round capsules remaining. And one of them seems to be missing. Oi, give it back. Jabra complained, but before he could get to Fukuro, Hatori the pigeon swooped in and took the box out of his hands, giving it to Luchi. Interesting. Luchi mused with a small grin, that surely pissed off Jabra, and if my guess is correct, you used one of them. Oi, give it back, flat mug. Jabra growled. Oh. And who's gonna make me? Your stupid face. Luchi said casually, pissing the other agent off, while he took one of the small capsules. Settle down you two. Keiku said, snatching the box out of Luchi's hands. Luchi just shrugged, pleased to at least see Jabra pissed for the day. And what is this anyways? Keiku asked. While others didn't recognize what it was, Luchi did. A Zoan drug that was rumored to boost the ability of any Zoan users for a short while. The boost was nothing to scoff at, there was a reason why it was highly sought after even though it just recently released into the black market. Even the world government was trying to buy them so that they don't fall into the hands of pirates or revolutionaries. But it did have its disadvantages. What's in the box, anyways? Keiku asked with a raised eyebrow. Well, these are the rumored Zoan drugs sold by Joker. Luchi said, taking the small capsule in his hand and sniffing it. A small grin stretched on his face. They are quite handy for Zoan users like us, thanks for giving me one, Jabra. Heard they work like a charm. Oi, who said I gave you one? Jabra growled, give it back. I stole it from the revs on my mission. It's my spoil of war. Luchi just gave him a smug smile. But weren't you supposed to give it to Shpondam, and since he's dead and I'm in charge, that makes me, hmm, what's the word again? Boss. Yeah, that makes me the boss. Luchi said smugly before he walked out of the room with a wide grin. I really hate you. Jabra growled, before sighing. It was a lost cause anyways. At least he had two left. But then right before his eyes Luchi snatched it from him, jumping back with a smirk. Ha, come on mutt. What are you gonna do about it? Jabra growled as he turned into his half-wolf Zoan from. Luchi followed suit going into his half-leopard Zoan form. Both of them growled at each other like wild beasts. Keiku just sighed, you guys have too much energy. He said, before using his new sword. His sword extended abnormally long, destroying the ground between the two Zoan users, making them back off. Oi, isn't that Shpondam's sword? Why do you have it? Jabra asked, 
pointing at Keiku. The agent shrugged, well, he won't be needing that in his grave. Keiku said, and besides I'm a swordsman, I can make better use of this than anyone else. Shpondam's sword was a unique one, a devil fruit weapon to be exact. One that had the power of long long fruit in it. Making the sword become exceptionally long if needed. A good weapon for a swordsman. TCH, another hypocrite. Jabra complained. Whatever. Everyone knew Keiku didn't need to use a sword, he was much better at using his limbs as swords. But they also knew that Keiku was a bit coy. Always liking the newest shiny thing. Keiku just sheepishly smiled, eh, whatever you think, but we should do our job. The last thing we want is to end up like that bastard Shpondam. With that statement, both Jabra and Luchi calmed down a bit. The cat of the group even gave back the box to its original user, before Jabra and Luchi went back to their human forms. Keiku was right, they did have a job to do. Chapter 397 The Going Merry The ship sailed the ocean at unimaginable speed. Two jet engines attached to its rear end boosted the ship's speed, making it cut through the waves of the ocean. The group of straw hat pirates left for Water 7 on their own. Icebig and the Frankie family wanted to join them, but Usopp refused. They were enough to save Frankie and Groat. They, of course, complained, but when Jin snapped at them angrily, they shut up. Usopp felt a bit bad for them. As for them, Frankie was their friend, and boss. So they obviously wanted to help him, even if it meant risking their lives. Usopp personally knew what it felt like to be weak enough to not help your friend in need. An image of Kaya and Captain Kuro came to his mind. That day, Usopp felt helpless and if it weren't for Luffy's encouragement and help, he wouldn't have been able to do anything back then. The members of the Frankie family weren't weak. But against the might of CP9, they wouldn't be able to stand. And with one of the Cypher Paul agents having the ability to put large groups of people to sleep, their involvement would only make things difficult. That's why they went in alone towards Ice Lobby. Still, Icebeg's group and the Frankie family did help with whatever they could, giving the crew a somewhat decent map of the Nice Lobby along with whatever information they had. Nice Lobby was a world government island, and information related to it was always kept secret. Icebug, the mayor of Nice Lobby, also explained what happened and how the CP9 set up an assassination attempt against him. They also made a scene and blamed the kid pirates to create a distraction so they wouldn't be found out. Icebug was also interrogated by Luchi and two other agents. One of them had the ability of the Zip Zip Fruit, which forced Icebeg to tell the truth about Pluton. He was helpless and almost left to die out in the burning building, but Law managed to save him in time. Law mainly wasn't much interested in Icebug, he was following kid pirates throughout the whole time in Water 7. The kid pirates were ruthless and if they got violent he wanted to take care of them without getting the rest of the crew involved. But nothing like that happened. Sure both kid and killers were embodiments of true cruel pirates, but they still had honor even paid full price to Icebeg to modify their ship. So it came as a surprise when suddenly there was news that they tried to assassinate Icebug. Law knew a setup when he saw one. And luckily with his powers, he was able to save Icebug from the burning building before he died. For that reason he was very grateful to Law and even promised to build his full ship, Polar Tang V.2, for free if he helped him. So Law just brought him to the crew, not knowing they were also attacked. The mayor also had explained the brief history between him and Frankie, along with the importance of destroying Pluton. A weapon like that could destroy the world. And that made things even more complicated. All of the crew members of the Straw Hat knew that Luffy, in time, would challenge the world government, and giving such a weapon to them would be a grave mistake. So they had to do something. Icebeg also suggested they use the sea train to get to Nice Lobby. Well, it wasn't technically the sea train, no it was a prototype that he had access to. But Usopp declined. Their going Mary had new upgrades, upgrades that were done by Frankie himself to boost her speed, and that would be enough. The ship of the Straw Hat crew could be seen almost speedboating through the waters of the ocean towards Nice Lobby. Waves, fish, anything that got between the ship and the sea got cut through, due to the extreme speed. Even against the roaring wind and toppling waves the ship sailed strong. Its structure now sported two jet engines connected to its bottom, along with six water wheels, made of hardened maple, that Jin, Hachin, Anchor, Cricket and Yusaku were biking to power. If the math didn't add up, then know that Jin was biking for two at once, going into his hybrid form. The loyal pirate blamed himself for not being able to stop the Cypher Paul agents. 
so Jin was taking responsibility this way. Usopp stood at the front of the ship as he looked towards the horizon. One of their crew members, a kid, was kidnapped right under his nose. A slash N, no. Nose pun intended. This wouldn't have happened if Luffy or any other was in his place. And the sniper blamed himself for that, he was careless. And now Frankie and Grote were kidnapped. But it won't matter, Usopp promised himself that he would get them back. Luffy had trusted him with a duty. And it was a man's job to follow through. He won't betray the trust of his captain. Dark clouds rumbled, the sea roared. The weather was wild today, according to Icebug, there was a chance of Aqua Laguna hitting the island of Water 7. It was usually impossible to sail a ship in this kind of weather. But then again, nothing was impossible when it came to their crew. The going Mary sped ahead, cutting through the waves with its speed. With such speed and bad weather, navigating the ship would have been a lot difficult, but Nami was doing it just fine. Cleverly using her maple powers to help guide the going Mary. Her navigation powers were always admirable, and her fruit really helped her control the ship better. Still, she was the navigator of the ship, not the helmsman. They would need a proper helmsman in the future for that. Chapter 398 How much longer till Nice Lobby? Usopp asked Nami. It was heavily raining outside, and the weather seemed to only get worse, but even with that, the ship was sailing through like nothing had happened. At least another hour. Even with our speed, it takes a lot of time to get there. Nami answered as she guided the ship towards their destination. Not even getting phased by the rain. But then again, her maple powers made her unique. As the water would bounce off her body and not make her wet. That wasn't the case with Honey Queen, so it was something unique that Nami managed to figure out. She was always crafty with her powers, after all. Usopp nodded before entering the ship's navigation room. Unlike Nami, he was fully soaked. Inside was Law and Isa, both taking shelter from the rain. While the doctor was calm and collected, Isa was panicking and asking Law a bunch of questions. All the while, Law just answered her bombardment of questions in an even tone. Are we going to save Grote and Big Bro Frankie? Can we beat the bad agents? Why is the sea acting bad today? Yes. Yes. Aqua Laguna. Law answered them calmly, not even phased by her questions. Seeing Usopp enter the room, Isa ran towards Usopp, Big Bro Usopp, can you really get Grote and Frankie back, what if? I'm worried about him. What if something happens? Usopp patted the girl's head, stopping her unusual chatterbox attitude. It seemed she was too worried about Grote. Poor girl. Usopp gave her a brave smile, and mustered up the confidence he lacked, don't worry, we will get them back. And no one can stop us. He said, we are the crew that's going to be the strongest in the sea. A crew that will find the one piece. This kind of challenge is nothing for us. Believe it. For some reason Usopp almost thought he had a whisker and blonde hair. Eh, stupid imagination. Hearing that almost calmed her down, a soft smile on her lips as her eyes shone with stars. Really? Of course. Hey, wanna hear about the time when I faced against an evil pirate captain with nothing but my toy guns? What? That's so cool. Ha, <laughs> of course it is. Usopp said, puffing his chest with pride at the fact that this time he didn't have to lie about being a brave warrior. So it went like this. Law smirked seeing their interaction, this crew really was a wild bunch. And in some ways it reminded him of his own crew. Law shook his head. He wasn't going to sob about that anymore. His crew had a dream. Dream to help people in need. And Law was going to carry that massage till the day he died. So he was going to honor their wishes and not be down about them. Still, his crew was a handful. Even with his own abilities, Law wasn't expecting his new crew to bust into one of the most secured islands in the Grand Line. Hey, troublesome. Isa calmed down a bit, and after talking for a while, Usopp took something out of one of the bags before going into the storage room. He needed to make something. If they were going against the world government, they needed a plan. He put the black transponder snail down, dialing in one number. Luffy took an ordinary transponder snail with him. Unless it was an emergency, he shouldn't be called, that's why he left the black transponder snail with Usopp. So that Usopp could call Luffy or anyone else without getting their signals eavesdropped on. The sniper knew what skills he had and what he didn't. And planning wasn't really his strong suit. Almost every time, their crew didn't need a plan. 
with their captain guiding them, they had almost nothing to fear. But Luffy wasn't around now. Nor were the monster trio. He was strong, so were Jin and the others, but still, going there unprepared might get them in trouble. Especially since Luffy's group was at the island of Marines. They needed to bust Grote and Frankie out without getting caught. And that's why he called the most intelligent person of the crew. Moshi Mosi, Robin here. Robin's voice came out of the other side along with her projection on the wall. She had a genuine smile on her face, and behind her were also curious Bartolomeo and Johnny. It seemed that Yusaku had made it back to Skypiea. Also seeing that smile on Robin made Usopp happy, it seems he really was enjoying the work back in Skypiea. It also made Usopp guilty about what he was going to ask her. After joining the crew and after knowing that she had a family she really did improve quite a lot. Now she wasn't always calculating and coy anymore. Hey, it's Usopp, and, well, I might need some help, Robin. Usopp said with an awkward tone. Robin frowned, looking a bit concerned. What happened? So Usopp started, explaining everything to her, and what could possibly happen. Behind her, Bartolomeo and Yusaku were pale from the news, obviously frustrated that they couldn't do anything. But Robin, on the other hand, remained composed. Her expression was unreadable at first, but she was also tense. Because she was angry. Usopp wondered if she was angry at him. And if it was the case then he would accept it, he did fail them. She sighed, calming herself down, so let me get this straight, you want me to basically make a plan to infiltrate Nice Lobby, to save our crewmates. And you want to do it without getting identified as a straw hat pirate. Usopp nodded, can you? Robin shook her head, it's not about can you, Usopp, it's that I have to. She answered, a cold look in her eyes, this crew is my family and I refuse to let even one of them be taken away by the world government. She said, evenly. Fury in her voice, she wasn't angry at Usopp. No, she was angry at the world government for always screwing everything up. She suffered because of them, and it seems tyranny knew no end. Understanding that, Usopp nodded. What do I need to do? How long do we have? Maybe half an hour before we reach Nice Lobby. She nodded, I can work with that. Bring in the whole crew, if you are going to attack an official government island, you might as well do it in a grandiose manner. She said with fire in her eyes. For some reason, Usopp was scared of Robin, she was almost giving off villain vibes. But Usopp didn't say anything and brought in the rest of the crew members. The going merry slowed down a bit, but it shouldn't take too long. The meeting went on for a while, with Robin explaining everyone's role. With the limited information they had. Even though the information on CP9 agents was supposed to be rare, Luffy had gathered quite a good amount of information about them. But they weren't the only issue, as Nice Lobby was a world government island there should be some high-ranking marines there as well, with that in mind they set up a plan that they could follow. A plan to not only save their crewmates without getting connected to the Straw Hats but making a mockery out of the world government in the process. Robin did have a personal grudge against them. The world government would soon realize what grave mistake they made. A slash N, a few things I changed about CP9 if you haven't noticed. I gave Califa a different fruit. The sleep sleep fruit, kind of similar to Midnight from MHA. As this is O, oh, she has had her powers since young, so she can do a lot of stuff with her powers. But her physical abilities, Dora Key, remained unchanged. For Bluno I boosted his physical abilities, Dora Key, because of the dangerous missions he was doing for Saint Camel. Also, lastly, I gave Fukuro, the zipper guy, the zip zip fruit. A paramecia fruit that has some unique abilities. I don't like mindlessly boosting enemy powers like other FICS. But even with that, I have to change some of them to fit the story. Also, as Shpondam isn't here, Keiku didn't get his zebra fruit. He got an alternate version of the sword Funk Freed. Funk Freed in canon was an elephant Zoan sword, but here it is a perennial devil fruit sword. Which has the ability of long long fruit. If you are a Bleach fan, you know where I got the idea. But even with that Keiku is still weaker than the canon one. Because remember Zoan's boosts physical abilities. No matter what type of Zoan it is. And Keiku didn't have that. His talent for Zoan fruit still remains. But whether or not he will get one in the future, or be killed, remains unknown. Shishishi. Now, I have stuff to do. So have a nice day. Bye. Chapter 399
399. Back at an ice lobby. Wake up. Someone said, wake up, bastard. With that, Frankie was kicked on the head, making him groan. Uh, five more minutes. Jabra's eye twitched, we ain't for that shit, he said, stomping on his shoulder, making Frankie finally somewhat wake up. Wah, the fuck am I? He said, vision blurry as he looked from side to side, oi, who are you, ugly mug? Why you? Jabra growled, but was stopped by Keiku. Frankie blinked, focusing on the long nose, soaking. Wait. You aren't soaking? Aren't you one of the bastards from Galilaw, eh? And why am I tied up? Speak with some respect punk. Sneered Jabra, we are the CP9 of the world government. And we want answers. Hearing that, Frankie became tense. Keiku leaned in, his long nose almost touching Frankie's face. The squared-nosed agent of the CP9 leaned in closer intimidating in his calm demeanor. We really hope you have the answers we are looking for. You see, our new boss is a bit stricter than the previous one. Frankie tried to move, but his limbs were restrained. His body was chained up. His eyes darted around to find himself surrounded by the other members of the CP9. And also someone that he recognized. I am Grote, a sad Grote said, also bound by chains and sea stone cuffs. Hey, so they even got you too, little guy. Frankie said, growling at Keiku, Luchi, Califa, and lastly, Bluno. So all of you were government scums hiding in Galilaw, not super at all. And why did you capture me, anyways? I'm just some no-named ship dismantler. Keiku kicked him in the side, making him spit some blood. Oi, Pinocchio. What's the big idea? Frankie growled, trying to add a little bravado despite his vulnerable position. You are being too soft, Keiku. Luchi said from behind, a cold smile on his face, he won't talk willingly. Keiku's eyes narrowed at Frankie, as he leaned down. Let's cut to the chase. We're here for the warship blueprints, Frankie. And you're going to give them to us. Right then, Frankie opened his mouth and tried to bite Keiku's head, but was kicked to the side of the wall by Luchi. Keiku gave the other agent a flat look, you know, I had it handled. Luchi just smiled not saying anything as he kept his hands in his pocket, I know, but he has a kickable face. Frankie coughed, I don't know what you folks are yapping about. I have no blueprint of Pluton. Bluno looked at him with a deadpan expression, and how do you know its name then? We didn't say Pluton. Uh, shit. I am Groat. Oi, at least I tried. Frankie said before he grinned, but I expected something like this, where's Spondum anyway? He set me up didn't he? Well, that's the thing, Jabra said with a grin, he didn't. He's ten feet under, that sorry bastard. That's six feet, you stupid face, Luchi said. Why you? Frankie blinked, not making heads and tails of the situation. Shpondam was dead? Who killed him? And if he wasn't here, then how did they figure out who he was? Did they get to Icebug? As if almost reading his mind, Luchi looked at him and grinned. We have simpler ways to make you talk, he said, looking at Fukuro, but we will take our time, you did try to hide such dangerous weapons from the world government. The least we can give you is pain. Is there a way to resist such a generous offer? Frankie snorted, but I have to ask. How did you guys find me? Oh, that, well, I had some rough talk with Boss Icebug. He was very reluctant to rat out his friend. But, he didn't last too long. Luchi said with a cold smile on his lips, such a sad thing that he had to die, he was a good man. Frankie was wide-eyed, why you? You killed him. Luchi just chuckled, really? What gave it away? Frankie growled, and even with chains chaining him down, tried to jump Luchi. But he fell face first instead when someone pushed him to the ground. It was Bluno. I am Groat. The tree creature said worriedly, but Kumadori put his staff in front of him to stop any of his movements. Bluno frowned. Frankie, this won't be pleasant if you resist. Jabra chuckled, let's just tear it out of him. Frankie growled, you won't get shit from me. Oh, we will see about that. Luchi said, before looking at Fukuro, we might need to use your powers for this one. He said before looking back at Frankie and cracking his knuckles. But let's break his will first. Frankie gritted his teeth while Grote looked pale. Before the situation could escalate further, 
the door slammed open, revealing a tall man with a long beard and a disapproving scowl, Spandine, the former chief of CP9. All the present agents were surprised to see him. Enough. Spandin's voice reverberated through the room as he walked in, not even looking at Frankie and Groat, heading straight for Lucci. The older man shot him a cold glare. My son, Spandam, is dead, Lucci. Dead. And you all were the last to be with him. I want answers. Lucci's stoic face remained unflinching. Spandam was killed when he tried to apprehend the kid pirates at Water 7. We were a bit late to get there in time, you have our apology. Bullshit. Spandine shouted in the agent's face, I know my cowardly son. He barely leaves N.I.'s lobby, and I know a setup when I see one, agent. Lucci's face didn't even change, like I said, the kid pirates. The tension was high in the room, as the older chief glared at the young agent. Only to be broken by a mocking laugh. Fa ha 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 ha, so that bastard Spandam was backstabbed. Frankie said, bringing all attention to him. The cyborg looked at Spandine, Oi, old man, you are right. Spandam didn't set foot in Water 7. If he did, I would have gone for his head first, so he was most probably killed by one or all of the agents here. Fa ha 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 ha. Bluno silenced him with a kick to the sternum, again making him cough, but his laughter still remained. Spandline gritted his teeth and glared at Frankie, Kill the bastard. Frankie still laughed. At least this way, the plans for Pluton wouldn't fall into their hands. No. Rob Lucci said, refusing the former chief's orders, We are sorry to say, sir. But we are under a mission given by our new chief King Bradley. And Frankie still has some uses, so we won't be able to carry out that order. Spandine, gritted his teeth, why you? Right then, someone else also entered the room, behave yourself Chief Spandine. It was Vice Admiral Anigamo. A world government agent shouldn't act this recklessly. All eyes turned to the vice admiral. Spandine growled, Why are you doing here? Weren't you supposed to be going out there and capturing the kid pirates? Anigamo snorted, I was after them, but due to the Aqua Laguna, our ship had to hold off their chase. Spandine cut him off, so you let them off? Some vice admiral you are. Anigamo frowned and glared at Spandine, shutting him up, Do not question my justice. Spandine looked away, even though he was angry at everyone for his son's death. He wasn't as influential as before. Seeing him like this, Lucci almost found it amusing. Just then, suddenly, an explosion went off in the distance. It was on the main island, and yet the whole Tower of Justice shook from the impact. What the? Spandine said, what's going on? Anigamo quickly took out his small transponder snail, Captain Very Good, what's happening outside? Sir, we have been attacked. Gah. The line on the other side cut off as silence fell in the room. Chapter 400 With the Straw Hats The sky cleared up, and the Straw Hat crew finally saw the Nevernight Island of Ennis Lobby. The island was small, even smaller than Water 7, with a defensive fence surrounding the whole island. It was amazing in a way that just a while ago, the Going Mary had to sail through a storm, and yet here, the weather was fully sunny. The island of Ennis Lobby really was a thing of wonder. Along with its weird geographical structure, one could see the giant gates of justice behind it. Gates so big that it almost stretched to the sky. Rumors say the gate never truly opens fully. It only takes a little bit for the criminals to pass though. And there was a chance that Grote and Frankie had already gone through that gate, if that's the case then things would be difficult. But. I hear them. Isa suddenly said, jumping up and down excitedly almost tears in her eyes, Usopp smiled at her and nodded. He also picked them up with his observation hacky, they are with a few others, both of them are hurt. We need to save them. She said bravely. Isa knew she wouldn't be able to join the battle, like others. But still will support her new friends in any way possible. And for some reason, she felt powerful, it was as if she could take on the challenges. Only then did she remember that she hadn't told anyone about accidentally eating a devil fruit. Before she could say anything, Usopp patted the girl on the head, we will save them, don't worry. He then looked at Jin and nodded. Usopp fixed the mask on his face and Jin wore his night helmet. The others were also ready with their disguise. If they were going to pull this off, they had to do it without connecting the Straw Hat crew. Robin had explained in detail what might be there. It was the judicial island of the world government. 
and they valued it more than the marine bases scattered around the Grand Line. So there were many capable officers guarding the island. With observation hacky one could sense and make an estimate of someone's strength based on their willpower. It wasn't concrete, as people were able to hide their auras really well. But Usopp could roughly locate all of the strong individuals on the island. If Luffy was around he would have been able to pointedly gauge someone's real strength. His observation hacky was a bit different after all. Everyone had a unique way of using their observation hacky. And for Usopp his observation hacky worked alongside his sight, giving him almost X-ray vision. Or what Luffy liked to call it wall hacks, his allies glowed green and other life forms stayed grey. With this, he could see all the strong individuals in Ennis lobby. And all of them were gathered around Frankie and Groat. Which wasn't good. It would be hard to save his crewmates this way. Guys let's stick to the plan, Usopp said, looking back at the others. There are some strong people on the island. So we have to be fast. Me and Jin will go in without trying to get detected, but you guys will need to create a distraction. Got it. Ha, stop worrying about us, Yusaku said, punching his open palm with his fist, we won't just create distraction, we will create destruction. He grinned. Oh, I'm good with that, Hachin said, he was still in his yellow skin form, to keep up with his disguise. He was an octopus fishman after all, and they did have limited ability to change colors. After learning to somewhat use life return, he was able to take that ability up a notch, and cooking. Anchor snorted, Oi, don't go too hard on them. Some of them are honest marines who are doing their job. So don't try to kill indiscriminately. Eh, but hunting marines is the fun part, Cricket said, getting an irritated glare from Anchor. Oh, come on Archie. I won't kill, that much. You know, I am really itching to shove that toothpick right up your... Nami cleared her throat forcefully, covering Isa's ears and glaring wickedly at both of them. That shut both of them up. Anyway, this is a serious mission, you lot. So give it your all, Jin said, as the others nodded. Even though everyone tried to play it off as not being an issue, all of them were a bit tense. Okay, is everyone ready, the going Mary will get spotted if we go any near, Nami said. The others nodded, all of them were prepared. Usopp was wearing his soaking mask, along with a red cape. On his waist were two custom revolvers, along with multiple other things. On his back was his long slingshot kabuto. Unlike others Jin didn't have his iconic weapons. His weighted tonfas were iconic and could be easily recognized so he was going to fight unarmed. But then again with his Zoan powers he wasn't going to miss them. Popeye D Anchor also for this reason didn't have his Anchor Axe Hammer, he was going to fight differently. He was a well-known former Marine so he couldn't use his usual weapons, or else he might be recognized. But it didn't matter. He was getting better at using the power of Munch Munch Fruit. And he had a good way to utilize it for his gains. Unlike them, Yusaku, Cricket and Hachin didn't need to change or hide their usual weapons. They weren't that famous so just their normal disguise would be good enough to throw them off. Law was also famous, but he wouldn't be joining the fight if necessary. He was the emergency escape after all. His powers have improved a lot since back in Skypiea. The Surgeon of Death didn't like how useless he was back in the dungeon so he made sure to train up his powers. So he was confident in teleporting, switching, them out if needed. But that wasn't all, he was also the backup if things got shitty. If the Marines managed to attack Going Merry then both him and Nami should be capable enough to handle it. All of the Straw Hats had one similarity, all of them wearing gas masks, made with Nami's maple ability. They didn't want to get knocked out like the first time, so they came prepared. Nami steered the going merry near the iron fence, while the crew prepared. Things were about to get messy. Right then several of the marines stationed there spotted the pirate ship and announced that they were going to bombard the vessel. It didn't matter of course as Hatchin and Cricket walked forward and with a combined attack defended the going merry. Usopp and Jin by then had already left for the main island, without getting noticed by the attacking marines and world government agents. As the Going Merry came near the iron fence, Law cut through the gate with Devil Fruit ability, making for the small ship to enter. Several marine vessels that were docked at the front gate also fired their weapons at Going Merry, but Nami came with her maple constructs. Protecting the ship and attacking the marine vessels. The full force of the world government island tried to attack the ship, but were failing miserably. But still, their numbers were a bit annoying. If the main fighters of the crew were here, most of them could be taken care of by a burst of Conqueror's hacky. But there were other ways to stop the ongoing attack. 
Guys buy me some time, I'm going to try something, Nami said, while the others gave their affirmative reply. Isa looked on curiously peeking in from the captain's cabin as the war between marines and pirates started. She felt helpless that she wasn't able to do anything, but she knew sometimes it was better to trust your friends. Nami came up front and stretched both of her hands forward, a ball of orange maple started forming out of her hands, as it started rapidly growing and shrinking. It was as if Nami was condensing a large amount of maple into the basketball-shaped construct, after a few seconds it was ready, and Nami called out, Maple Meteor. With that, she launched the construct at high speed into the sky. It went so high that it broke through the clouds, going above them and for a while nothing happened, but it soon came back massively in size. And the size seemed to be rapidly growing as it started falling towards the front main gate of the island. Seeing the giant meteor construct, drew the attention of the nearby marines and world government agents. Even the present straw hats were awed by the size of that thing. The so-called meteor was at least four times the size of the going Mary. This should be enough of a distraction, right? Nami asked sweetly, winking at his jaw-dropped crewmates. Collectively the straw hats gulped and made a note to never piss her off. The marines and the world government agents, on the other hand, ran for their lives. Thanks for listening.